Nabam was not one of our case. That's not our contention at all. Nabam was one of our important arguments. The other was equally important was violation of principles of natural justice. And the third was imminent, immediate danger to the lives of the MDAs whose houses were being burned and relatives being threatened. That is why we came in a 32. And that is hugely different and was not barred by Kehoto at all. Because our contention was not that your lordship decides on the disqualification petitions, as they are claiming. That was not the prayer in our petition. Our contention was that Nabam, even as it stands today, has held the judicial field. It is a constitution bench decision, and the speaker had no jurisdiction to proceed with the matter at all, apart from the principles of natural justice being violated. The court, keeping all this in mind, only on the issue of natural justice on that day, extended the time, did not injunct the speaker, extended the time. Now, extension is interpreted to say because extension was granted to 12th of July, it effectively meant an injunction. I don't see how. If you violate a provision of the rules which says adequate notice should be given, you, the speaker doesn't give that notice. The Honorable Court says gives them more time. Now, after that, my lords, what does the governor do? The governor in his letter writes to say that seven independent MLAs who were supporting a ministry have withdrawn support. The leader of the opposition has written to me to say that they have no confidence in the ministry. Within the ministry, a large section of the legislative party have moved a resolution saying that they do not support the MBA ministry and government. Given these facts, I think it prudent and call upon the then Chief Minister, Mr. Thakre, to come and prove his majority on the floor of the House. Lord, I put a question to myself, what else is the Speaker, uh, the Governor expected to do? Your Lordship's words again in Gumai are, by whatever process or means, the words used by your Lordship in Gumai are, by whatever process or means, the governor can gather the information that is required, which raises a credible doubt as to the majority of a government in power. The only course open is a floor test. And that is what the governor goes ahead. You refuse to face that floor test. And your only answer to that is it was a fait accompli. So, my lords, if legislative if democracies which have to be tested on the floor of the house are going to be decided on, if my fate complies, so I only want to face a floor test and yet want to continue in government, is that acceptable? Is that constitutionally acceptable? The only mechanism known is a floor test and you evade that. And then you cast aspersions on a constitutional authority to say, which in any case today is the norm, you can cast any aspersion on anyone you want to. And you say that the governor in question failed to discharge his duties acted with bias in an amalefide manner. Because what was he expected to do? Seven independent MLAs say we have lost confidence. The leader of the opposition writes, 34 of the 55 MLAs pass a resolution saying we have no faith in the ministry any longer. Now, before I proceed further, my lords, I want and before I proceed, issue-wise, I want to show these two judgments. Because so much time has been spent on the powers of the governor and that he acted with malafide intent and the solutions that your lordship has asked for, what could have been done by the governor? It has said he definitely could not have asked for a floor test. And the only way to get out of all these judgments is to say that those cases did not involve a disqualification petition pending. Now, my lords, the moment your lordship in Shivra Singh Chauhan Kuldeep Bishnoi, and any number of judgments have said that, and Shivraj Singh Chauhan especially, that proceedings under the 10th statute, which concern disqualification and a trust vote, operate in entirely different fields. In the meantime, the right of an MLA to participate in the proceedings of the House continues, and he continues to participate and vote. Now, my lords, if their submission is taken to be correct, firstly, it's wrong because it's in the teeth of what Bumai and Shivraj Singh Chauhan says. Then when your Lord says, ask them what could be done, they say zero definitely if disqualification petitions are pending. 
which is in the teeth again of Shivraj Singh Chauhan, which says that irrespective of disqualification pending, irrespective of resignation letters pending, they will participate in the House. And that comes back to the same question that if an MLA is permitted to participate in the floor of the House, the legality as far as those proceedings are concerned can't be questioned. You can't say that all proceedings, budgets, decisions, bills passed will all be null, and we will restore status quo. And when I come to Rana, I'll point out to my lords, Rana is completely misread. Rana was in the context where the speaker's power, the Supreme Court held that when the speaker decides the disqualification issue, he sees the events as on that date. Because there, a set of MLAs had gone and shown support to a rival faction and gone to the governor. The split took place later. They sought to seek the defense of the 10th schedule as it then existed. The Supreme Court ultimately said no. As far as the governor is concerned, the facts will be seen on the day when they approach the governor. The Supreme Court never said that the MLAs who participated in trust votes, the MLAs who have taken decisions, proceedings which have been legally conducted, will all stand annulled. Because ultimately, it comes down to the argument being that if ultimately your lodges were to hold them to be disqualified, the EC proceedings couldn't have gone on, the trust vote could not have happened, and thus restoration of status quo ante, which would mean annulling everything that has happened. That's effectively the argument being made before your lodges. To stay the EC proceedings, four hours, to four hours of argument were addressed that EC should not go on with the same argument. That if EC goes ahead with it and, and later on it's found that these people are disqualified, they have no right to approach the EC. And a question was put by a lot of even on that day, what about his right as a member of a political party? In any case, who will decide this? Whether there has been a split in the political party, and then you presume, as if I have argued that there is only a split in the legislature party and not in the political party. We have consistently said so, including in our resolution dated 21st of June 2022, that a legislature party is integral and organically connected and co-joined to a political party. What is said in the legislature party is a reflection of what is happening amongst millions and thousands of cadres of the ship Sena across the country because there was a huge discontent of aligning in the MVA with people who you were ideologically opposed to right through your political careers and existence. That was where the discontent arose from. That you fought an election with another party. After that, suddenly we went along with another party. That was the political discontent. So we were conscious and rightly talked about the political party discontent. But who will determine this? Who is the whip? There are two whips we are talking about. They say your whip is only appointed by the legislature party. We say no. To say that our whip appointed by the legislature party does not represent the authority of the political party is wrong. Ultimately, right or wrong, the EC today has taken a decision. That's the subject matter of another petition which your lodges will decide. But even on that day when a stay was asked for, our respectful submission was, how can the Supreme Court today, without the concerned constitutional authority at all deciding on the issue, at all deciding on the issue, take a call on these matters? Just because you say so and you presume we are person disqualified. Now, please have my lords, Bumai and Shivraj Singh Chauhan only on the powers of the governor before I proceed, because that's one of the most glaring submissions made in the teeth of settled law of the land. Please, for the vault. So call. Judgment call. So your submission starts with the primary principle that the proceedings under the 10th schedule operate independent of the power of the governor, irrespective of the pendency of the 10th schedule proceedings at any point of time, the governor can ask a floor test, and number one. And if he asks, then are there any limitations with respect to the fact that the Ten schedule proceedings are pending. Should he wait, not wait? Because the, the primary question will depend yes. upon. I, I, I bow down. My lords, I bow down. Your lordships have summed it up very well. May I just add to what your lordships are saying? In addition to what your lordships summarized, is my second limb of the argument that your lordships have already held in any number of judgments that an MLA during pendency of a disqualification petition is fully entitled to participate and vote. 
If that were so, then what is the hindrance to a flow test being conducted? And in all those matters, the issue arose the same. During pendency of disqualification petition, should the flow test take place or not? I'll show those paras. And your lodges answered by saying, why should the flow test not take place? In the meantime, you can't without the decision of the speaker say that a person is disqualified. So there's a little the problem, catch there. You see, there's a catch there. Yeah, the, the problem really is this: that the antecedent circumstances which give rise to the necessity of a flaw test are based on an alleged this uh, qualification, alleged this the defection, right? So. Why is a flow test necessary? The need for a flow test arises right. because of the fact that a group of legislators may, stand may be disqualified as a result of their having formed a split from the party. This, this may or may not be from, but yeah, yes, yeah. Within, within there's a rival the legislature party. Now, if the validity or the legitimacy of the split is itself in question, then holding or directing the holding of a flow test before the disqualification issue is resolved would result in this, that are you not then pre putting a premium on the very circumstances which gave rise to the disqualification? So, so my, my lords, A, your lodges have answered that, have answered that and I'll show those judgments where this very question arose, that can those MLAs against whom a disqualification petition is pending? participate in a flow test. There also you are right. Look because, at the reverse. Because the law is very well settled that the mere pendency yes, of a disqualification petition does not preclude a member of parliament or the legislature in the state from exercising all rights and performing all functions of a legislator. Undoubtedly. But equally, we have to be cognizant of a situation where the reason why he or she can exercise all the functions as a legislator is because the speaker not has been not permitted to decide the disqualification Lord, issue. May I, with respect, say, my lords, as far as that so is So, step concerned. one, the step one, the speaker is told to defer a decision on the disqualification issue. So, the disqualification issue cannot be decided. Therefore, why can the legislator not be restrained from exercising all rights on the floor of the House because of the judicial edict? that you shall not hear the disqualification until the 12th of July, step one. Step two, why is the trust vote required to be held up to, up to the 21st June? There was never any requirement of a trust vote. What is the requirement of a trust vote? The requirement of a trust vote arises because these seven independent MLAs, then, you know, the 34, they all start clamoring and they say, well, there, there is disquiet within. We don't uh, owe allegiance, and the, 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 our, our chief uh, minister has lost the uh, lost the confidence of the party. Now, the point of the matter is this: that if that is the reason for the unsettling of the government in the house, then the antecedent basis of that is itself the allegation of disqualification. So, if you allow a government to be toppled, then in but circumstances, may I, with respect, say firstly. And yes. I said, I've, I've just begun. This is not okay. Just flagging it. Yes, yes, just flagging yes. it. Yeah, we are just flagging it. No, no, I am very grateful. I am very grateful. Yes. Right? These are the concerns. Yes, yes. This is not a case where, say, there is a three-party or four-party coalition in a state. Two parties say, we are pulling the rug. They are entitled to, there is no disqualification. You are, you are four parties which have come together in an agadi. And those two parties say, we are pulling the rug. And we want to get out of this government. It doesn't have the mandate of why we came together. Governor can say, say, the two of your constituents have, you know, pulled out. Now, please show me that you established, you owe the, you, you owe, uh, you have the allegiance of the house. Because there, there is no, the, the problem arises in cases like this, where the reason for the trust vote is so intrinsically related to the alleged disqualification itself. You're right. My judgment in Shivraj says that, well, these are two independent yes, issues. But there is a... Uh, no, let me... Also you, an so, so, let me... Recall one another thing. Uh, in addition to this, what is what are their submissions? There is no difficulty that both are independent. Correct? There is no difficulty that both can go together simultaneously. 
but their submission is correct that if those persons who are to be against whom the disqualification proceedings are pending hmm, are permitted to cast their votes in the on the protest in the no confidence motion if ultimately after some time correct the speaker takes a decision and they are disqualified they are disqualified from day one from the date of their conduct correct then what will happen to that so it, their case is that it is better correct that the disqualification proceedings are initiated first that is what their submission you have to answer that also yes yes madam i i will that is the crux of the mm -hmm. that main submissions may i let's firstly you can argue on only this was only warm up let's yes, start with uh, let's start with boma right. because boma yes, i thought right. I thought, let me start with that and I'll come. I'm conscious what my Lord has said. I'm very grateful. I'll address those questions. Anything Happy more time. than five in that sense is uh, gospel for us because, you know, we are bound by Absolutely. it. Not only that, my Lord, of course, you know, right yes. there, but even I want to show two paras, even as far as Bumai is concerned, on how Shivraj deals with it. It's important for your Lord just to see right. that. Fair enough. So we'll see Bumai. And then yes. First, we see Bumai and then see Or arts and principles. Yes. Yes. Judgment. Yes, 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 yes. So, judgment volume two. Kindly have para 119. Uh, where is it? Your convenience compilation? Volume Vol Vol 2, my lords. Okay. Judgment compilation, volume 2, PDF page 368. 368. PDF page, I think. PDF page? PDF page 368. 358. 368. This is quite dismissal of. Yeah. One one nine. Seven. Who gets it? Well, it's may I? Yes. Absolutely. Well, in this connection, it is necessary to stress that in all cases where the support of the ministry is claimed to have been withdrawn by some legislators, the proper course for testing the strength of the ministry is holding the test on the floor of the House. That alone is the constitutionally ordained forum for seeking openly and objectively the claims and counterclaims in that behalf. The assessment of the strength of the ministry is not a matter of private opinion of any individual, be he the governor or the president. It is capable of being demonstrated and asserted publicly in the House. Hence, when such demonstration is possible, it is not open to bypass it and instead depend on the subjective satisfaction of the governor or the president. 
Such private assessment is an anathema to the democratic principle, apart from being open to serious objections or personal malefits. It is possible that on some rare occasions, the floor test may be impossible, although it is difficult to envisage such a situation. Even assuming that, even assuming that there arises one, it should be obligatory on the governor in such circumstances to state in writing the reasons for not holding the floor test. The High Court was therefore wrong in holding that the floor test was neither compulsory nor obligatory or that it was not a prerequisite to sending the report to the president recommending action under 356.1. Since we have already referred to the recommendations of the Sarkaria Commission in this connection, it is not necessary to repeat them here. Now kindly have para 121, same, yes. same page. We may, on this subject, refer to the unanimous report of the five-member committee of governors, which recommended as follows. The test of confidence in the ministry should normally be left to a vote in the assembly, where the governor is satisfied by whatever process or means that the ministry no longer enjoys majority support. He should ask the chief minister to face the assembly and prove his majority within the shortest possible time. If the chief minister shirks this primary responsibility, and fails to comply, the governor would be in duty bound to initiate steps to form an alternative ministry. A chief minister's refusal to test his strength on the floor of the assembly can well be interpreted as prima facie proof of his no longer enjoying the confidence of the legislature. If then an alternative ministry can be formed, which in the governor's view is able to command the majority of, in the assembly, he must dismiss the ministry in power and install the alternative ministry in office. On the other hand, if no such ministry is possible, the governor will be left with no alternative but to make a report to the president under Article 356. Now kindly have para 391 on page, PDF page. Well, PDF page 517. 391. 391 and 395. Yes. My lords have para 390. Yes. We must also say that the observations under point 7 is equally misplaced. It is true that action under Article 356 is taken on the basis of satisfaction of the Union Council of Ministers, but on that score, it cannot be said that legal malefactors of the governor is irrelevant. When the article speaks of the satisfaction being formed on the basis of the governor's report, the legal malefactors, if any of the governor, cannot be said to be irrelevant. The governor's report may not be conclusive, but its relevance is undeniable. Action under 356 can be based only and exclusively upon such report. Governor is a very high constitutional functionary. He is supposed to act fairly and honestly consistent with his oath. He is actually reporting against his own government. It is for this reason that the Article 356 places such implicit faith in his report. If, however, in a given case, his report is vitiated by legal malefactors, it is bound to vitiate the President's action as well. Regarding the other points made in the judgment of the High Court, we must say that the High Court went wrong in law in approving and upholding the Governor's report in the action of the President under Article 356. The Governor's report is vitiated by more than one assumption totally unsustainable in law. Constitution does not create an obligation that the political party forming the ministry should necessarily have a majority in the legislature. Minority governments are not unknown. What is necessary is that the government should enjoy the confidence of the House. This aspect does not appear to have been kept in mind by the governor. Secondly, and more importantly, whether the Council of Ministers has lost conf the confidence of the House is not a matter to be determined by the governor or for that matter anywhere else except the floor of the house. The principle of democracy underlying our constitution necessarily means that any such question should be decided on the floor of the house. The house is the place where democracy is in action. It is not for the governor to determine the set question on his own or on his own verification. This is not a matter within his subjective satisfaction. It is an objective fact capable of being established on the floor of the house. It is gratifying to note that Sri Raman, the former president of India, has affirmed this view in his Rajaji Memorial Lecture. And now kindly have para 395 on, on page 518. 395. 
the high court in our opinion erred in holding that the floor test is not obligatory if only one keeps in mind the democratic principle underlying the constitution and the fact that it is legislative assembly that represents the will of the people and not the governor the position would be clear beyond any doubt in this case it may be remembered that the council of ministers not only decided on april 20 1989 to convene the assembly on 27th of that very month that is within 7 days but also offered to prepone the assembly if the governor so desired it pains us to note that the governor did not choose to act upon the said offer indeed it was his duty to summon the assembly and call upon the chief minister to establish that he enjoyed the confidence of the house not only did he not do it but when the when the council of ministers offered to do the same he demurred and chose instead to submit the report to the president in the circumstances it cannot be said that the governor's report contained or was based upon relevant material there could be no question of the governor making an assessment of his own the loss of confidence of the house was an objective fact which could have been demonstrated one way or the other on the floor of the house in our opinion wherever a doubt arises whether the council of ministers has lost the confidence of the house the only way of testing it is on the floor of the house except in an extraordinary situation where because of all pervasive violence the governor comes to the conclusion and records the same in his report that for reason mentioned by him a free vote is not possible in the house now kindly have my lord shivraj chauhan which follows this entire 1996 also there. yes my lord i right, just 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 give me a minute just 1997 also 396 we make it clear that what we have said above is confined to a situation where the incumbent chief minister is alleged to have lost the majority support or the confidence of the house it is not relevant to a situation arising after a general election where the governor has to invite leader of the party commanding the majority or the single largest group to form the government we need express no opinion regarding such a situation now see para 397 yes we are equally of the opinion that the high court was in error in holding that enactment addition of 10 schedule to the constitution has not made any difference the very object of the 10 schedule is to That's prevent simple. and discourage floor crossing and defection which at one time had assumed alarming personal predilections a legislator elected on the ticket of a party is bound to support that party in case of a division or vote of confidence in the house unless he is prepared to forego his membership of the house the 10th schedule was designed precisely to counteract a horse trading except in the case of a split a legislature has to support his party willingly this is the difference between the position obtained prior to and after the 10th schedule prior to the said amendment a legislature could shift his loyalty from one party to the other and any number of times without imperiling his membership of the house it was if he had a property in the office so here they say actually yeah. bomai this is a completely different situation Bombay was a case where the Council of Ministers had uh, offered to summon the House the session of the Legislative Assembly within a period of one week. Governor says, "So sorry, I'm I'm convinced that you have lost the confidence of the House. Therefore, you send the report to the President under Article three fifty six. There, the court holds that this course was not open to the Governor." the only way to establish whether they had lost the, uh, the, the 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 majority of the assembly was to order a floor test and therefore the governor couldn't on his own personal opinion that they had lost the uh, majority say that well i'm going to send a report to uh, the so, president under 356 so second they also make it clear that uh, with the introduction of the 10th schedule right unless it's a case of a split which was a position prior to uh, the deletion of the split in 2004 the only case where you can not vote for your own party is a split okay. otherwise you are bound you are bound by the four tails of the party which is no difficulty to pass no difficulty so now post 2004 with the split having gone away as a defense yes you the only the only other available exception is the case of a merger right right Save and except in the case of right. a merger you are bound to vote for right. the party or right. right no difficulty but my lord two things firstly no doubt as the facts my lord the chief justice summed up a woman but bumai doesn't just restrict itself to those facts of what bumai says is the moment a support for ministry is withdrawn the moment the fact is that the in that case the chief minister was keen to face a floor test the governor dissolved the house and sent a report to the president but what para 119 says is the moment a support to a ministry is withdrawn the only option left to the governor is to conduct a floor test you know if we accept this extreme proposition very uh, radical results will result 
on the one hand you have the 10 schedule which is to prevent you know the sin the constitutional sin of defections on the one hand you say that well somebody who defects or causes a split is liable to a disqualification at the same time we say that look even if that person is liable to be disqualified in the meantime you must hold a trust vote in the on the floor of the house Hello, that is why if the antecedent reason for a floor test is based on a violation of the prescription in the 10th schedule then holding a floor test at that stage will very will defeat the whole basis and purpose of the 10th schedule then no my lords may i with respect say when your lot is firstly and you are legitimizing then a defect which is otherwise not permissible under the 10th schedule that's what is happening actually firstly our case is not a case of a split at all i am not relying on any defense at all i am neither relying on three which in any case does not exist or on merger that's not been my case i have right through argued that we are talking about a rival faction within the party which is dissent and a sense of democracy within a party and we claim that we are the shift sena and that is what comes to be decided i am not for a minute either relying on the defense or merger or on the split of one third that's their contention my case has never been but whether you are facts whether you are the shift sena or not whether you are a shift sena or not can't be decided can't be decided on the floor of the will be will be of course not the lawyers are right who is the political party will be decided by the election commission of india and that power is vested in the eci and your lawyers in judgment after judgment from sadiq ali downloaded that said that the exclusive jurisdiction and there's a presumption of validity as far as decisions of the eci are concerned and come to those decisions on the 30th of june there was no decision of the eci no no my lords on 30th there was no decision of the eci for the simple reason that if the decision will come when someone raises that issue it will only be when a party approaches the eci there can't be a decision of the eci divorce a party approaching the eci mr call the eci you know where is the question of the party approaching the eci for our understanding on 30th there was only one party you were part of the party yes that there was a faction within or without you contested the election on the strength of a ticket given by the party which was the original party <laughs> then and i still say i am the original party they are the overwhelming minority to say you are as we understand to show it within the party on the yes basis and uh, absolutely right my lady is right do it in the house no 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 i am not saying i do it in the house that's why i am saying floor test and majority in a political party are completely different issues When you go uh, back to the party members to no. say okay here is a faction that we think are actually the shiv sena so we are going to the party as if not the just the organization but each one who counts in the party that makes the party to say now we are so let me let me answer that let me answer that one is which is the rival faction within the party who should be recognized as the party under the symbols order that's what the symbol order provides for that can only be decided by the election commission and no one else who represents the party and is the recognized which faction is the recognized political party that's one part in the meantime a ministry which has lost the confidence of the house cannot continue is a completely different issue for which the floor test is meant i am not going for a floor test in this matter to show that i am the majority in the shiv sena political party that has never been my case has never been my case at all i am going to the floor of the house to show that you mr thakre and the nda government coalition government that you lead has lost the majority because seven independent mlas and 34 of the 55 mlas have no faith in you now they are presuming they are presuming that this is only a rival faction within the legislature party and not a rival faction within the political party whereas you lots of time and again said you can't segregate the two a legislature party is also an extension of the political party in fact for the continued recognition of a political party the legislative presence of its mlas and the percentage of vote it polls is a necessary ingredient for continuing recognition under 6a and 6b of the symbols order and sadiq ali took note of it they said for a party's continued recognition as a political party its performance in the electoral hustings 
its vote percentage, its MLAs and MPs are equally important. These are their arguments. And that is what I've been saying to you yourself. You're the judge, you're the jury. You say, per se, disqualified. There was a split only in the legislature party. And thus, nothing else needs to be done. My whole case has been, it's a case of internal dissent. We are the faction which represents the Shiv Sena. That issue can only be decided by the uh, election commission, where your lodges refused to stay those proceedings. The same argument was made. As far as the floor test is concerned, it is only restricted to the issue whether the chief minister or the ministry has the confidence of the house or not. And what does the governor do? The governor says, comes and face a floor test and you resign. Now, that was a pertinent question that day, which was put by your lodges and my lord, the chief justice saying that had this chief minister not resigned, one could have possibly seen what is the effect of those 39 plus four, four votes or three votes. Now, two answers to that. You remove those 39 plus three or four, 42 votes. We are still through by a mile. And I've prepared those charts and I'll show. You remove each of those 39 plus three votes whose 42 and all, whose disqualification was pending, we were still through. In that case, that's one. Secondly, my lords, my first contention would still be, why should those uh, 42 be deleted at all? Because let's face it, on that day, Nabam held the field. If Nabam held the field, Nabam said that as far as the speaker is concerned, he should not proceed with his uh, with disqualification till its own case is decided. But let's take it. Let's take it. They should have been excluded. A chief minister who does not go through even with the deletion of 39 plus 3 or 39 plus 4, both for the election of the speaker and the election of the chief minister, he fails in both cases. I prepared those charts with 42 without 42 because as your lodges rightly said with those 42 goes and the total strength also comes down <laughs> it can't be that you remove them and you don't remove them from the strength of the house so whichever way you look at it whichever way you look at it presuming for a minute the trust was was directly related according to me no well it's in every disqualification is only a 10 scheduled case there can either be a 191 1 or a 192 2 these are only two cases of disqualification one can either be for the grounds provided in 191.1 or 192.2 is 10 scheduled. In 191.1, there's a procedure provided for the president, speaker, etc. in consultation with the election commission, you get disqualified. Under 191.2, when it comes to that, that's where the 10th schedule is kicked in. Now, all those judgments that your lodges have dealt with are all cases that if a disqualification is pending, the trust vote will still go through. In each of those cases, it could have been argued that if this disqualification petition had been decided, the trust vote would have been differently affected. It could have been the same argument in every case. Bomma is a, a lays down a normative principle that floor test is the actual test. Yes. It hasn't really taken into account the sequence in which the power of the governor has to be exercised in the case of defections. Bombay, therefore, has it goes only that far. In its application in the subsequent judgment of Shivraj Singh Chauhan, has the court given an exposition of how Bombay operates yes. in the context of Shivraj Singh Chauhan? So should I go to that, Madam? Because I wanted you that I, yes, I wanted to. I wanted to actually go to because it just flags it here yes. in Bombay and 396 and 397. And it says that the situation that would arise so far as the principle of Bomma is concerned in the context of 10th schedule stands on a slightly different footing. It says that far and then doesn't say anything further. The thing which needs to be seen with the advent of the 10th schedule is that power of the governor to ask for a floor test in the context of 10th schedule when it should be exercised. Because the fundamental difference is that floor test will be determined by this decision because the composition of the house will change. Absolutely. For which you have your answer is that it makes no difference on facts. And we are more on the principle. Yes, no, lordships are absolutely right. Even on the principle, my lords, when your lordship said that a floor test must go on in other judgment, leave aside our case, must go on irrespective of the pendency of disqualification petition that was not in vacuum. Your lordship said it in the context that mere pendency of a disqualification petition cannot impact a trust vote being conducted. That's what your lordship said. Because in every case where a MLA is disqualified, 
his vote one way or the other, whether his abstention or actual voting, would have had an impact on the trust vote. So my question is, my lord, to myself, how and in what ways? The individual facts of every case will vary on what day the letter went, what happened. But the principle, as your lordship rightly said, is that you cannot merely, because a disqualification petition is pending, prevent an MLA from voting in a trust vote. Now to say that you had the trust vote done because in the meantime your disqualification petition was pending, these are all hypothetical questions. Now then questioning the governor to say, governor should not have called the floor test, what else could the governor have done, my lord? Okay, sure, Shivraj Singh. Yes, Shivraj Singh Chauhan. Please have. Sorry? Judgment Compilation Volume 1. Yes, Judgment Compilation Volume 1. PDF Please, I Yes, my lord, uh, please start with Ara. Which volume? Which volume? Sorry. 1359. Huh? Judgment compilation one. And page 13. 1359, para 16. Yes. Uh, Mr. Manindra Singh, learned senior counsel. Yes, sorry. Where did you see what is, the, what is the cycle? Yes. Uh, Mr. Maninder Singh, learned senior One counsel appearing. Yes. Mr. Maninder Singh, learned senior counsel appearing, appeared in an application for impeachment moved on behalf of 16 members who had tendered their resignation to the speaker, but whose resignations have not been accepted. On their behalf, Mr. 
Singh submitted that an elected member of a legislative assembly has an absolute right to resign by virtue of provisions of Article 190 of the Constitution. The Speaker of the Madhya Pradesh Legislative Assembly accepted the resignation standard by six members who are part of the same group of 22 members within the span of one day and in doing so has chosen not to make any inquiry in regard to the remaining 16 letters of resignation. Resignations and disqualifications are distinct concepts. The exercise of judicial review in regard to advice tendered by the Governor to the Chief Minister to convene a trust vote is not warranted. 16.5 in urging submission, Mr. Singh placed reliance on the decision of three judge bench in Sriman Bala Sahib versus Karnataka Legislative Assembly. Then, 17, Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, learned senior counsel, appearing on behalf of the Speaker of the Madhya Pradesh Legislative Assembly, submitted that and kindly have 17.8, my lords. The precedence of this court in regard to convening of a trust vote have arisen in the context of fresh elections held to the legislature and not in the context of a running assembly. This was the same contention raised there. Now kindly have para 60, 65 and 66. You are right, same contention. 65 and 66. Uh, PDF page 1380. 138? 3. 1380, my lord, para 65. My lord, the Chief Justice has para 65. Yes. 65. In analyzing the observations made by the nine judge bench in SR Bumai, it is pertinent to rem remember that the governor in that case did not call for a floor test. Rather, the governor of Karnataka sent a report to the president based on which the proclamation was issued <coughs> under Article 356. The observation in SR Bumai can be relied on in determining whether the governor possesses the power to call for a floor test. Discerning the subsequent question of when the exercise of such power is appropriate is a distinct issue. On a perusal of the above observations in SR Bomai, it is evident that whether or not the Council of Ministers has lost the confidence of the House must be determined only on the floor of the House and not by the Governor conducting an independent verification. Where the Governor has reasons to believe that the incumbent government does not possess the support of the majority in the Legislative Assembly, the correct course of action would be for the Governor to call upon the Chief Minister to face the Assembly and to establish the majority of the incumbent government within the shortest possible time. An exception to the invariable rule of testing, whether the government has the Assembly's confidence on the floor of the House, is envisaged only in extraordinary situations where because of existence of all pervasive violence, a free vote is not possible in the House. Then 66. As a matter of constitutional law, it would not be correct to proceed on the basis that constitutional authority entrusted to the governor to require the Council of Ministers to prove their majority on the floor of the House can only be exercised at the very first inception after general elections are held and not when the governor has objective reasons to believe that the incumbent government does not command the confidence of the House. The governor is not denuded of the power to order a floor test where on the basis of the material available to the governor, it becomes evident that the issue as to whether the government commands the confidence of the house requires to be assessed on the basis of a floor test. Undoubtedly, the purpose of entrusting such a function to the governor is not to destabilize an existing government. When the, satis when the satisfaction on the basis of which governor has ordered a floor test is called into question, the decision of the governor is not immune from judicial review. The court would be justified in scrutinizing whether the governor prima facie had relevant and germane material to order a floor test to be conducted. It must be noted that the governor does not decide where, whether the incumbent government commands the confidence of the house. The purpose of holding a floor test in the Legislative Assembly is precisely to enable the elected representatives to determine whether the Council of Ministers commands the confidence of the House that verification is not conducted by the Governor. The decision in SR Bumai, in fact, held that recourse to the power under 356 was not warranted in a situation where the issue of confidence would yet be decided on the floor of the House by calling for a trust vote. Undoubtedly, in that case, it was the Chief Minister who had suggested following a meeting of the Cabinet that the House should be convened for the purpose of testing the majority of the Council of Ministers. The significance of the decision lies in the fact that the decision of the go Governor to submit a report under 356 was faulted on the ground that the floor test would have been an appropriate course of action. Now, so whether in Bumai, the Chief Minister offered to face a floor test and the Governor declined to do so. Maybe the peculiar facts, the larger principle in Bumai or in Shivraj Singh Chauhan that your lordships have laid down, that your lordships have 66 though. The first, first half of 66 exposition is that it's untrammeled to that extent. 
Please, my lords. The first half of 66, para 66 is yes. governor's power is untrammeled, not confined to the inception. Right. And that was the specific question posed. See, the para 71. Very good. Come further. Now. Yes. The power of the governor. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the powers which are entrusted to constitutional functionaries are not beyond the pale of judicial review. Where the exercise of the discretion by the governor to call a floor test is challenged before the court, it is not immune from judicial review. The court is entitled to determine whether in calling for the floor test, the governor did so on the basis of objective material and reasons which were relevant and germane to the exercise of the power. The exercise of such power is not intended to destabilize or displace a democratically elected government accountable to the legislative assembly and collectively responsible to it. The exercise of the power to call for a trust vote must be guided by the overarching consideration that the formation of satisfaction by the governor is not based on extraneous considerations. So, my lords, please read this with the observations in Bumai that no independent view of any person, including the governor, at the end of the day, he must reco take recourse to a floor test because these are not his individual opinions. His individual opinions are only meant that prima facie it appears that the majority has been lost by the ministry in power. And after that, how does he determine? The court says you can't determine it on your own and say you've lost majority, thus I'm dissolving the house. The best way to do it is ask the chief minister concerned to face the floor test. And that chief minister in this matter refuses to face the floor test and resigns before that. And the only argument being made is because it would have been an empty formality and disqualification petitions are pending. Firstly, my lord, that can be no argument in law, but BI goes a step further, you exclude those 42. What happens? You still lose. Para 72 also. Mm -hmm. 72. 72 and 73. 72 and 73, my lords? Yeah. yeah. 72 and 73. While the constitution recognizes that the gov governor does not possess a power That's here. That's so, sorry, my Recognize, sorry, I'm so sorry. While the constitution recognizes that the governor does possess a power in hearing in the office to monitor that the elected government continues to possess the confidence of the legislative assembly, this entrustment ought not to override or displace the basic responsibility of the executive to the legislature or the ability of the legislature to demand accountability of the executive arm of the state. Dr. Singhvi's submission that the governor cannot demand a trust vote except at the initial constitution of the legislative assembly following an election would be to unduly constrain the constitutional entrustment authority to the governor. Undoubtedly, the largest number of precedents emanating from this court have dealt with the situations where a trust vote was called at the time of the initial formation of the government following an election. One of the reasons for this may well be the prevalence of disputes at the time of the initial formation of the government in the states. But this line of precedent would not exhaust the power of the governor, nor does it suggest that the authority which is entrusted to the governor cannot be exercised once a government has been formed. Mr. So-and-so, on the other hand, accepted that there may be situations where the House is not in session, having been prorogued, and there arise circumstances leading the governor to a reasonable belief that the government has ceased to command a majority in the Legislative Assembly. This, in our view, would certainly be one of the situations where the governor would be justified in calling for a special session in the course of which the incumbent government may be required to establish that it continues to hold the confidence of the House. In a situation where the House has been summoned, Following the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers, the position would be more nu nuanced in the sense that the remedy of a no confidence motion would be available to any segment of the legislature seeking to espouse the view that the government has ceased to command the confidence of the House in exercising the constitutional authority to demand a trust vote, the governor must do so with circumspection in a manner that ensures the authority of the House to determine the existence or loss of confidence in the government is not undermined. Absent, exigent, and compelling circumstances, there is no reason for the government, uh, for the governor, to prevent ordinary legislative process of a no confidence motion from running its due course. The governor is an appointee of the president, but does not represent either a political ideology or a political view. 
the governor is expected to discharge the role of a constitutional statesman. The authority of the governor is not one to be exercised in aid of political dispensation, which considers an elected government of the day to be political opponent. The precise reason underlying the entrustment of the authority to the governor is the ability to stand above political conflicts and with the experience of statesmanship to wield the authority in a manner which subserves the which subserves and does not detract from the strength and resilience of democratically elected legislatures and the governments in the states who are accountable to them. To act contrary to this mandate would result in the realization of the worst fears of the constitutional framers who were cognizant that the office of the governor could potentially derail democratically elected governments but nonetheless place trust in future generations to ensure that the government of the people, by the people and for the people would not be denuded by those who are designed to act as its sentiments. Era 74 also, so four first four lines. In discharging this crucial role, it is necessary that the governor bear in mind that the purpose underlying the entrustment of the authority to require a trust vote is not to displace duly elected governments, but to intervene with caution when the circumstances which are drawn to the attention of the governor indicate a loss of majority. And that is exactly what the governor did in this case. Seven independent MLAs write to him to say we are withdrawing support. The leader of the opposition writes, 34 of the 55 MLAs, now of course 40, say that within the party, that's why I know this whole thing of split, merger, that's no one's, that's never our case, that's their case. To say that since there is no merger, since law para 3 is not available, you have per se incurred the disqualification. And our case right through has been that whether we represent the political party, the Shiv Sena is the recognized political party, or you do, is a matter which the election commission will decide. The speaker, my lords, if your lordships will recollect and just... Fully in, this present, in the present case, when the leader of the opposition writes to the governor, the governor could have advised the leader of the opposition to bring a motion of no confidence to the house. Right, but my lords, nothing stops the governor. Today, we are testing the bona fides of a decision. My lords, to say that the governor opted for one option the instead of the... Of the cannot cannot duck the responsibility of summoning or, or placing a motion of no confidence yes, by getting the governor to direct the convening of a trust. Malas, may I with respect say the leader of the opposition did not get the governor to do anything. The leader of the opposition brought it to the notice of the governor. Seven independent MLAs also brought it to the notice of the governor. 34 MLAs within the party wrote to the governor to say that we will not support this ministry and the governor in exercise of his discretion after applying his mind, satisfying himself that the conditions accepted, followed Bumai, followed Shivraj Singh Chauhan to say that the best course of action available would be a floor test. I mean, it's, if your lordships and a nine judges and Shivraj Singh Chauhan have said that that is the first course, you must follow that. And if the governor says, I'm following it, the only line of attack is because a disqualification petition but is what pending. The objective material for the governor. Yeah. Unless the objective material was the moment, firstly, seven independent MLAs, the leader of the opposition, and 34 out of the 55 seven. MLAs say you do not independent us. MLAs have nothing to do with the strength of the uh, government in the house. Yes, they, the they were the part of the government. There is absolutely no role because. That applied when the government was formed. No, no, my lords. They continued to support the government. Those seven were part of the, they with due support to the government, my lords. Those seven with due support to the government. Were they holding ministerial posts? Uh, I don't know. What? So were they holding ministerial, ministerial posts? Two of them. Two of them. My lords, they were part of the government. They were part of the well, let's, let's test it. When your lordships in para 121 of Bomai say uh, they, that they the governor... Gave, remaining gave letters of uh, support to the government during its formation. Please, my lords. The remaining, apart from the two who became ministers, did they just check it up later? There was just well, check, it up, check it up. Actually, we'll check it up. My lords, please see. MLAs who are part of the government say we are withdrawing support. The leader of the opposition says he has lost support. 34 of the 55 ruling party MLA say that we represent the real Shiv Sena. We have no faith in this coalition continuing. What is wrong? They have called for a floor test. 
told if he had dissolved the house, if he had called someone else to form the government, dismiss the government, he's not done any of it. He's just said you come and uh, prove your majority on the floor of the house. Their entire argument is that because of disqualification is pending, test that proposition, my lords. According to us, because we passed a resolution, they gave a disqualification uh, 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 notice to us. That's our case. Reverse the proposition. Suppose you want to defeat any bill, any decision on the floor of the house, the easiest thing is give disqualification notices to parties. Now, in this context, if you see uh, 75 of Shivraj Singh, yes, yes. I, the court there held that there was objective material before the governor. That's yes. the kind of, just see that para 75 and 76 in the press yes. case. So we then get an, some flavor of yes. what, what are the yes. circumstances which you know, the governor can call for a yes. protest. Yes. That yes. 75 yes, my lord. May I have a theologist for yes. Mary? In the present case, the facts which have come on record indicate that the budget session of the Legislative Assembly had been convened on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers to commence on six, from 16-3-2020. The governor was intimated that 22 members owing allegiance to the INC has tendered their resignation to the Speaker of the Assembly. Copies of the resignation letters were forwarded to the Governor. At this stage, the validity of these resignations had not been discerned and no decision had been taken, made by the Speaker as to whether the resignations were voluntary or genuine. The Chief Minister subsequently tendered the advice to the Governor for the removal of the six Ministers who were Ministers in the State Government. On 13 3, 2020, the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly issued notices of disqualification. However, on 14 3, 2020, resignations of six members who were ministers of incumbent government were accepted by the Speaker, acting in exercise of the constitutional authority under the proviso to Article 193b. The Chief Minister, adverting to the turmoil in the state, addressed a communication to the Governor, 13 3, 20, stating that the convening of the floor test would be a sure basis for resolving the conundrum. This is a strong indication that the Chief Minister himself was of the opinion that the situation in the state had cast his government's majority in doubt. However, upon the convening of the Legislative Assembly, no floor test was conducted and the House was adjourned till 2060 2020. These facts form the basis on which the Governor advised that a floor test be conducted. Based on the resignation of the six ministers of the incumbent government accepted by the Speaker, the purported resignation of 16 more members belonging to the INC and the refusal of the Chief Minister to conduct a floor test despite the House having been convened on 16 3, 2020, the exercise of power by the Governor to convene the floor test cannot be regarded as constitutionally improper. Now, my lords, apply to the facts of our case. The Governor notes there is violence, they are being attacked, 34 of 55 do not support the ministry. Seven supporting independents have also withdrawn. The leader of the opposition has also written to the same extent. He doesn't dissolve. He doesn't swear in another government in power. He says you come and clear, uh, prove your majority. And your lodges, if have right to say that it's his duty to summon the house and said that no governor or any other individual should form an independent opinion. One of them, Bomai or Lodges, has said that the moment a governor starts forming in these matters and substituting his opinion to dissolve the house, instead of a floor test being ordered, it would be dangerous for democracy. I'm, I'm just testing the proposition of the other side, my lord, because it is being said or not. This material, in my respectful submission, mm -hmm. is more than sufficient to meet the test of judicial review because your lodges are not substituting your view for that of the governor. All that your lodges are seeing is whether the decision-making process was apt, it was not accentuated by malafides or bias in this matter or any extraneous consideration was not taken into account. And in the given circumstances, my lords, the governor taking the re requisite facts into account, the surrounding circumstances into account, comes to an informed decision that floor test should be conducted. And he orders a floor test now because you feel the floor test would have led to a situation where you were unable to face the majority, then that should be the end of your government. Which government should be allowed to continue, which cannot face a floor test, my lords? Irrespective of disqualifications pending or not pending, can any elected representative ever say that I want to continue in the ministry as an elected government without facing a floor test? Now just look at the governor's what letter. Is? Can this even say, can this even work? I mean, look at para one and para two. What does he say? That convenience compilation number. I think. Mark. Uh, that Malad. convenience compilation two. number. Two. 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 Uh, uh, volume PDF, two. PDF three. Uh, page three. Page three twenty six. Yes. Pura Just let's read that. Uh, yes, sir. Malad, I'll read the whole thing. I'll read the whole letter. Yes, you Yes. 
I'm in receipt of two letters dated 28 6 2022, which have been received at the Raj Bhavan Mumbai. The first letter has been given by seven independent MLAs stating that you have lost the majority on the floor of the Vidhan Sabha and requesting me to call for a special session of the Maharashtra Legislative Assembly and to direct you to prove your majority on the floor of the House. A similar letter dated so-and-so has been received from the leader of the opposition stating that you have lost the majority in the Maharashtra Legislative Assembly and a floor test for proving your majority in the Vidhan Sabha is urgently required. I am in receipt of a resolution dated 21 6 2022 signed by 34 members of Shiv Sena legislator party stating that there is enormous discontent within the Shiv Sena cadre and the electorate on account of the alliance of the NCP and INC. The resolution clearly indicates that the majority members of Shiv Sena legislator party want to exit the alliance with NCP and INC and to that end they have reaffirmed the appointment of the leader of the Shiv Sena legislature party. I am also in receipt of a letter dated 21 6 2022 addressed by Eknath Rao Shinde to the deputy speaker stating that the purported appointment of one Mr. Ajay Chaudhary is illegal having been made by 16 MLAs without notice and without quorum and therefore the same is inoperative. A letter dated 25 6 2022 was also received by me whereby 38 members of the Shiv Sena Legislature Party have alleged that the security provided by the state government to them and their family members have been illegally withdrawn. It is stated in the letter that various leaders of the state government are instigating the cadre to initiate violence against 38 MLAs as a result of which the offices of some of these MLAs are vandalized. I have also been made aware that there have been grave threat to life of these 38 members and also their families. I have seen the developments through electronic and print media very clear, closely, which substantiate the above facts. The apprehension of the MLAs is also fortified by the letter of the leader of the opposition who has in fact provided links to videos where Mr. Sanjay Rath has openly stated that dead bodies of the MLAs will come to Mumbai and will be sent for post-mortem. Mr. Sanjay Rath in, uh, in an interview given to the national TV has also said that ongoing violence is not even a trailer but is just the warming up. Certain news articles reporting open and rather disturbing threats to 39 MLAs of Shiv Sena have also been enclosed with the letter issued by the leader of the opposition. In response to the aforesaid letter dated 25 6 2022 received by me on behalf of MLAs of the Shiv Sena, I had wide communication dated 25 6 22 directed 1. The Home Secretary, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, 2. The Chief Secretary to the Government of Maharashtra, and 3. The Additional Chief Secretary, Home uh, uh, Department, Government of Maharashtra. Director General of Police Maharashtra State and the Commissioner of Police Mumbai to provide adequate police protection to the MLAs and their families on the immediate basis. It is thus clear that a majority of Shiv Sena MLAs have given a clear indication on behalf of the Shiv Sena Legislature Party that they intend to exit from the Maharashtra Vikas Agadi government and that you have been made aware of the same and that you are trying to win over your MLAs and cadre by means which are not democratic. Mm -hmm. I am therefore confident that you and your government had lost the trust of the House and the government is in minority. The Honorable Supreme Court of India in a range of decisions has time and again held that the governor possesses a power to monitor that the elected government continues to enjoy the confidence of the Legislative Assembly. It is therefore within my power and discretion to, for, uh, to call for special session of the Maharashtra Legislative Assembly and direct a floor test to a certain as to whether you enjoy the confidence of the majority in the house. My discretion is guided by the aforesaid facts. Please refer to Shivrat Singh Chauhan versus Speaker Madhya Pradesh Legislative Assembly. Further, with a view to obviate any undemocratic method being employed, such as violence, illegitimate and unseemly political bargaining and horse trading in a quest for political power, the Honorable Supreme Court of India has consistently insisted upon convening a trust vote at the earliest date. In the aforesaid case of Shivrat Singh Chauhan, the Honorable Supreme Court has held that a trust vote in the ultimate analysis is to uphold the political accountability of the elected government. Some of the other judgments of the Honorable Supreme Court of India, which require the immediate holding of the full trust as so-and-so. As per the judgment of Shivraj Singh Chauhan, where the circumstances of violence and coercion exist, that would undermine a free and fair vote in the Assembly. The Governor must take measures to ensure that the sanctity of the trust vote is maintained. In the present case, use of undemocratic means, such as violence and coercion to influence the vote, cannot be ruled out. The Maharashtra Legislative Assembly rules contemplate voting by a division by asking members to rise in their seats for the purpose of countering a vote. Such procedure for voting would, according to me, ensure that the members are allowed a free and fair vote in the present case. This is in line with the series of judgments delivered by the Honorable Supreme Court. Therefore, in keeping with the constitutional and democratic values and principles, as also the law laid down by Honorable Supreme Court of India and in pursuance of the powers conferred by Article 174, led with 175.2 of the Constitution, I hereby issue the following direction. A special session of the Maharashtra Vidhan Sabha be summoned on 30th 6, 2022 at 11 a.m. with the only agenda of a trust vote against the government. 
the business over the house shall be conducted in such a way that the speech if and any are concluded in a short period of time and the trust vote is concluded on 30 at 6 by 5 pm the voting will be conducted by members to rise in their seats for the purpose so the of only reason really a lot of this is completely constitutionally extraneous the fact that you know some mlas have said that well uh, you know their safety is an imperil that i directed as a governor that their safety should be provided this has nothing to do on whether the government should be asked to uh, face a trust but, vote. The only point which he says really is this two points. One, seven MLAs have said that, the, uh, they, that they don't owe allegiance to the government. And more important, the 34 say, 34 MLAs have indicated that they want Shiv Sena to exit from the alliance yes. with INC and the, the and, Maharashtra Vikas. Maharashtra Vikas not from the party, but from the coalition government. Manoj, the resolution of 21-6-2022, as also this letter categorically says that there is a huge discontent within the party. All what happens is that, you know, once governors start this process of, you know, intervening in a, in a, in a sitting house, that only sort of gives... Manoj, uh, may, may, may I with respect say, when you... Why not ask whoever wants to move a no-confidence motion? Manoj, may I with respect, no with respect, my lords, your lodges have said... Why should a government which has been formed and in respect of which there was absolutely no disquiet uh, just a month earlier, he asked to suddenly face a trust vote. Malas, may I with respect say, the basis of these Malas, for, a, for a government to lose a majority, there cannot be a cutoff date. That event in politics can occur at any time. Whether it enjoyed majority a month earlier or it loses majority a month later, with utmost humility I submit, is inconsequential. What is important is on the date when the governor applies his mind, was there a representation by the requisite number of members of the Legislative Assembly to say that we no longer have any faith in this government? Consciously on 21st of June 2022, 34 or 35 MLAs wrote to show that there is a huge discontent and discord within the party of an MVA alliance continuing. We, they don't say we are merging with someone else or we are splitting. They say within the party, and we do not want this government to continue. Seven independent MLAs who are part of the government, right? Now, my lads, I put a question to myself when from nine judges to Shivra Chauhan, your lodges has said the first duty is to summon the house. Why should that governor ask anyone to move a vote of no confidence? When your lodges have guided the governor time and again in various situations to say that the first right you must exercise as a constitutional authority is to summon the house and call for a floor test and ask the chief minister to prove his majority. Why should that governor exercise in discretion and say that no, no, because one month earlier there was no disquiet. Today, a vote of no confidence should be moved and not a floor test. And ultimately, as I respectfully submitted, your lodges are not sitting as a court of appeal. Even if your lodges feel that another course of action may have been a more appropriate course of action, the fact is, as long as what the governor does is within the constitutional principles as laid down in Bhuvai and Shivraj Singh Chauhan, that is good enough. Now, for a minute, leave this aside what fell from my lords, the violence, what was happening to MLS, exclude that. What is required is the essential ingredient for a flow test. The need for a flow test arises when there is a representation that the concerned chief minister of government has lost the confidence of the house. Now, as far as the confidence of the house is concerned, what material will the government look at? Uh, the governor look at? The governor will naturally look at the representations of various MLAs in the assembly to say that they are no longer supporting. What other material can he look at? And that is why, my lords, your lordship. The head of the political party had not informed the uh, governor that we are withdrawing from the alliance. No, my lords. The alliance still continued between the three parties. There was yes. no intimation by the head of the political party. Who was who was also the chief minister? He had not intimated the government. He had not intimated. Drawing from this alliance. Alex, he need not, but if 34 out of 55 write to him to say, Manas, again, as I'm saying, he's not dealing with 10th schedule. That's a separate argument I'll come to. He is dealing with 34 out of the 55 MLAs writing to him to say, we have no faith in this government, in this chief minister. Seven independent MLAs who are part of the government say, we have no faith in this government. Leave aside the leader of the opposition for a minute. Now, my lords, when a governor takes a decision to conduct a floor test, what is the most important consideration in his mind? The most important Mr. consideration Call, in his mind. Mr. Kaulson, read para 78 of the judgment. My lords, of, of Sivra uh, Singh Chauhan. Just give me a moment. The purpose what you are saying. 78. 
The idea underlying the trust, my lord, the Chief Justice has that. Yeah. Uh, the idea underlying the trust vote in the ultimate analysis is to uphold the political accountability of the elected government to the state legislature. Assertion of accountability is a mirror image of the collective responsibility of the government to the legislature. The requirement of the trust vote fulfills that purpose in the present case. The present con controversy has shone a light on the often fluid allegiances of democratically elected representatives. This is a matter of their for their conscience and the court expresses no opinion on the matter. However, it is important to note that in directing a trust vote, the governor does not favor a particular political party. It is inevitable that the specific timing of a trust vote may tilt the balance towards the party possessing a majority at the time of the trust vote is directed. All political parties are equally at risk of losing the support of their elected legislature, ju legislators, just as the legislators are at the risk of losing the vote of the electorate. This is how the system of parliamentary governance operates and the learned senior counsel on both the sides of the disputes congenially admitted that the outcome of the trust vote is the ultimate litmus test for the legitimacy to govern. However, we note that where the evidence indicates that circumstances of violence and coercion exist, that would undermine a free and fair vote in the assembly. The governor and the court must take measures to ensure that the sanctity of the trust vote is maintained in the circumstances as they have emerged in the case. The exercise of authority by the governor who was based on circumstances which were legitimate for the purpose of ensuring that the norm of collective responsibility is duly preserved. There existed no extraordinary circumstance for the governor to determine that a trust vote was not appropriate course of action on 16th, 2020. Now, my lads, all that I'm respectfully submitting today is that merely because it will turn the uh, uh, in favor of one or the other, the Lord just deal with those issues. Let's, let's, I put myself in the governor's position. My Lord, suppose he had not held a trust vote. One of the first challenges would have been despite a nine judges bench, despite Shivraj Singh Chauhan, despite MLA's writing to him, why did he not hold the floor test? Where is the requirement in law, my Lord, that if a governor after due application of mind comes to a conclusion, that a trust vote ought to be held, he should nonetheless have a vote of confidence, moved on the floor of the house and not going for a floor test. Where is that requirement in law? And presuming for a minute, both options are available and he opts for one instead of the other. Would that be enough for your lodges and exercise of your lodges extraordinary jurisdiction to strike down the decision of the governor in a matter like this? That this is a decision so influenced by extraneous consideration or so biased or unfair, accentuated by malefides that we will strike it down. As a decision, it's a decision based on due representations made by MLAs. Yes. And naturally, my lord, when these MLAs make representations, these are on political considerations. Mr. Call, uh, as your claim is not either a split or a merger, your yes. claim is on the ground that it, you are the political party. Right, right. Now, in the information given to the governor, to what extent the information available as to you have garnered the political Yes, so my lord, as I, it political, not the legislative majority. My lord, where I, is that kind of a material? I, I'll, I'll just come to it, my lord. Yes, I'll come to okay, it. Take your tomorrow, order. if your lodges permit. And just, I, plan, no, no, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful that your lodges actually yes. in, in so far as the governor's uh, decision is concerned, go by Bomai. The principle of the the judicial review is confined to the question as indicated there. Material is available to him relevant material, then judicial review is available. The relevant material available for him to direct a floor test must be in relation to that kind of a decision that you have now garnered the, garnered the political, uh, uh, not the legislative, but political power may with I, respect to the party. Look, may I with that material is available or not? I'll, I'll address your lodges tomorrow on no, that. No, in your and own time. Ten schedule is where this whole argument of legislature, political party, is political party co-joined with legislature party? Was it only within the political party or within the legislature party is one part. As far as the governor in exercising his powers for a floor test is concerned, his only consideration is whether on the floor of the house, the members enjoy the requisite majority or not. And my respectful submission there to your lordships would be, that there all that he has to see is that the elected representatives who constitute the composition, total composition of the house, is there a substantial challenge to say that a large number of them are withdrawing their support to the ministry, which raises a genuine doubt in his mind 
to say that uh, the majority of the ministry must be proved on the floor of the house and which material was here. He doesn't have to embark on that exercise, which is a part of 10 schedule, political party, legislature party. All that he has to see is elected representatives, 34 of 55, seven independent who are supporting, and as I said, exclude the leader of the opposition completely. But uh, Mr. Paul, once the government is formed, yes. it is not open to any group of members of parliament or of the legislative assembly to say that, look, we don't want to go with this alliance. You have an alliance of five parties. It is not open to, say, a group of persons who owe allegiance to the dominant political party in the alliance, as in this case, uh, the Shiv Sena was, right? Shiv Sena had 55 as opposed to 44 of the Congress and 53 of the NCP. It's not open to any one segment of the uh, any political party, whether it was the Shiv Sena or the NCP or the Congress, to say, we don't want to go along with this. That would ipso facto attract the disqualification provisions. You are bound by the whip. And you are bound to vote with your party so long as you are a legislator, so, unless there is a merger. That's, that's why, my lords, as I so, say... On the one hand, none of them, either 15 or 20 or 25 or 30, can say to the governor that, look, we don't want to go along with the alliance. Answer is very simple. You don't want to go along with the alliance? Vote your leader out in the political party or take a decision in the political party outside. So long as you are a member of the House, you are bound by the discipline of the House. Uh, you have to vote with your political so, party. So, just to answer what by not the So, what they, were, in, so what they were essentially telling the governor was this. We don't want our political party to continue with this three-party alliance of the MBA. Right? We want to exit from that. Governor takes cognizance of it. Now, what he is essentially taking cognizance of is that there is a breakaway segment of this particular party. In that letter of the governor, one state. thing which is completely absent is your argument that we are the Shiv Sena. The entire letter is postulated on the fact that there was a, out of 55, there are 30 more people who want to break away from this alliance. And what is this but not a split? Well, may I, may I have the, respect say? the governor at least was not alive to this argument at all that you know you represented the Shiv Sena. Well, may I extraneous to the exercise of power? Well, may I may that I just make say that is not something the relevant material. <laughs>
as far as the political party is concerned, that's the domain of the election commission. Today, it has been presumed as if I did not have the requisite political whip in my favor, that I did not represent the requisite majority within the party, and thus I have ex sorry, incurred. I have incurred the disqualification under the act, uh, under the constitution. And my respectful submission right through has been says who, just because you say, doesn't mean I'm disqualified. That has to be decided by an appropriate constitutional authority, which in this case, Dr. Wrong has decided in my favor in this matter. But be that as it may, you can't presume and say that you have incurred ex facie the disqualification and thus you were not entitled to write. After all, the concerned body has to decide that. According to me, I represent within it the view of the political party. Our resolution also, my Lord, when your Lord just put a question to me to say that this part that we are the Shiv Sena was not something which gets reflected in the speaker's letter. My Lord, that I'm letter, letter. So I'm, I'm, so, so, I'm so sorry, the governor's letter. That very letter of the governor refers to the resolution of 21st June 2022, which I'll read out tomorrow to your lodges, which says there's an overwhelming discontent in the cadres of the party. The party does not want to continue. So it's not as if the governor just dealt with, and this is my argument, which I've just presented before your lodges, the governor was cognizant of the fact that the resolution on the basis of which 34 MLAs wrote to him in turn referred to the large discord and discontent within the political party, which was because of continuing with MDA. The cause is not important. The reason is not important. The reason could be anything. There it was corruption and it was MDA. Could be anything. The fact remains is they were discontent. The fact remains is that an overwhelming part of the political party did not want to go along. Now, whether your whip represents the right wing, then my learned friend started going into when was the committee meeting held, what was, those are not the, that is not within the purview of the constitution bench today. That will be decided and is being decided by the EC. That who represents within the party, the actual recognized political party. I, I'll even touch on those 18, 7, 20, 7, 7, which are not sub the subject matter of this reference to your lordships. We'll, we'll continue. We'll see the other, the resolution which you said you want. Yes, I will read, my lords. I'm very, very grateful, my lords. I'll continue to. Wait. We'll continue tomorrow morning.
Mr. Singhvi, you are known to keep your word. Yes, I'll probably over keep the word. Please. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20, 25 minutes. I'll be very pointed. Okay. Just slowly, only one second. The residual uh, part. So we take your written submissions that you have uh, that you were reading earlier. That's right. That's right. There's only a short portion which was left. Yeah. 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 Now your written submissions are on. Yeah. Your not just written submissions. Last time you also using were A3. 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 Right. Singhvi, you are known to keep your word. Yes, I'll probably over keep the word. Please. <laughs> <laughs> 20, 20, 25 minutes. Half an hour. I'll be very pointed. Okay. Just only, it's only one second. The residual uh, part. So we take your written submissions that you have uh, that you were reading earlier. That's right. That's right. There's only a short portion which was left back. Yeah, yes. I'll be well, reading that part and just oralizing the beginning one set of points just to no repetition. So what was the number points. of that? They'll include my uh, well, a lot should put we start A3. Yeah, yeah. A3, right? One aspect. A3. A3. So if, now your written submissions are on. Yeah. Your not ship written submissions. Last time you were using A3. A3. A3, right? Is so, well, as I'll just about seven, eight points, they'll include my written submission, but I just want to yes. make a point. Amalus, one aspect which a lot of has heard in a somewhat diffuse manner, I want to itemize it. The question is Would my Lord's Malus not want to prevent such consequences by dealing with the law and laying down the law here? That's the proposition. What are those five plus deleterious, four deleterious consequences for constitutional law, for constitutional morality, for the whole system, the entire edifice plus, which is an interlocking system of plus, uh, defections, speaker, legislative wing, governor, they're all ultimately interlinked into one plus scheme. I, my submission is these five, six, uh, four, five plus deleterious consequences should impel your lordships to decide it here. What are those bills? Number one, can you disable the speaker so easily, thereby sounding the death knell of 10th schedule? My lord has heard it fully. Navam Rebia is the main malus standing obstacle and we have argued on that. That's consequence number one. Second, Malus, is the positive and the negative injunction. I'm just tying up the ends together into a distance. Which are against Kihoto. It is not only the practical effect of this positive and negative injunction, but it is juristically against Kihoto. Uh, so no. Hearing, I am a veteran of this business. Your lordship may consider keeping a raised platform. Ah, that is what I on which this, this is too little, Malus. This should be raised. Oh. But then I thought, you know, I can't see the lawyer. That's, that's, the that's, problem. That's, that's a small price to pay for what your lordship will gain. Malus. And your lordship may be missing nothing much. <laughs> because this flat raising, I keep a flat raising on that 
it, it helps a lot because otherwise a lot should be bending now yeah. and you have to the way you have to keep your back straight ah, ah. and you have to bend down in any case if it's not raised no raising means half of you are vanished from my screen <laughs> that's the problem i think all of us but on that side of this we have these yeah possible issues this is a, uh, an occupational hazard in old vintage well it's uh, so the second part is well it's the positive and negative injunction is not only factually wrong and has caused the change of government that has caused well it's, i made that argument earlier but it is juridically wrong that's the second consequence your lordships should rectify only supreme court can do these rectifications nobody else can but well, it's really futile to have a whole ladder again starting some high court some well it's the ladder going all the way to supreme court it really is futile it's, well it's, nobody can touch these are of kyoto these are navam rebias the formal is third is the consequence of the governor's direction for a floor test Well, there is no way in which the governor can interfere like this, especially in a case where disqualification is sub judice or pending. The consequence of the governor's direction for a floor test. Floor test in a pending disqualification matter. sub judice at two levels but sub judice at your lordship's level sub judice at the speaker's level it's a double sub judice he's been the actor deciding in a quasi judicial capacity there as a tribunal Sure. Okay. Into in this this third point. Sorry, not the board. This third aspect can be well as rephrased juridically in a different way. Whereas your lordship is dealing with a legislative issue primarily. Executive has no role to come into it. laterally sideways the executive can't enter it else the governor is though a constitutional post holder an executive appointee so this third aspect is really the executive direct lateral entry into a no go area totally impermissible that's a consequence a lordship alone can rectify should rectify that applies to all these consequences somebody else will decide it will be partial decision supreme court for the polity for constitutional morality for the whole system must decide this is part of your third point only this is under consequences seems one first point is consequence a b c this is the third one the fourth one is bullets it is distinct but it relates to the governor the governor recognizes a split but if your lordship can't do it governor will do it the supreme court with 142 today bullets if a judgment is passed under 141 142 saying we recognize a split your lordship would be acting contrary to law the governor can do it directly recognizes in writing a split with great respect here there is a there is inbuilt double whammy the governor is an error as a constitutional holder and the executive is well is coming into and recognizing the central government executive is coming in and recognizing a split now that letter your lordships may not have seen for some time now maybe in the beginning it was shown just turn to that letter well is for a minute para 7 of the pdf compilation 2 326 correct pdf yes pdf 326 compilation 2 dated 28th june 2022 okay 
This is very important for us. A constitutional amendment promoting the constituent parliamentary intent to do away with split is collaterally recognized by an executive appointing governor who has no locus, which the Supreme Court can't also do. Compilation of there are CC2. There is a number for each uh, document. CC2, it is called, right? Yeah. CC2 of the document, not the case law. Convenience. Oh. 326. Convenience. 326. 326 is yes. the PDF page. So the governor's name on 28th of June. In that, well, the volume it is serial number 5. In that volume. Yes, the volume is called serial. Oh, I see. The volume is called serial number 5. My apologies. Where is your lordship? It just takes. Okay. P4. 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 An extra P4. P4. Yes, sir. We got it. I see. I My lord know. doesn't have it. Perhaps not such My leadership has got it. Yes, please. Dear, is, dear Shri Udhavji, the governor writes to the chief minister. I am going to emphasize para 7, but I will read 2 and 3 also leading up to 7. It's para 7 I want to read, but I will just read 2 and 3 for backdrop. I am in receipt of a resolution dated 21-6, signed by 34 members of Shiv Sena, legislature party, stating that there is enormous discontent within the Shiv Sena cadre and the electorate on account of alliance with NCP and INC. The, uh, the resolution clearly indicates that the majority members of Shiva Sena Legislature Party want to exit the alliance with NCP and I INC. And to that end, they have reaffirmed the appointment of the leader of the Shiva Sena Legislative Party. I am also in receipt of a letter of 21 June addressed by Mr. Shinde to the Deputy Speaker stating that the purported appointment of one Ajay Chaudhary is illegal, having been made by 16 MLAs without notice, without quorum, therefore the same is inoperative. So this the governor is saying, well as the governor can hardly at all interfere in any of these subjects while disqualification is pending at two levels. But that apart, leave two and three. Now come to seven. But how can the governor say this? Kindly read seven. Is it possible? Forget the right or wrong. How, why should the governor say it? How can he say it constitutionally is my question to myself. It is thus clear that a majority of the Shiva Sena MLAs have given a clear indication on behalf of the Shiva Sena Legislative Party that they intend to exit from the Mahavikas Agadi government and that you have been made aware of the same and that you are trying to win over your MLAs and Kader means not democratic. I am therefore confident that you and your government has lost the trust of the house and the government is a minority. I'll just pause and look at the, let's just forget this case for two minutes. Look at the consequences of this letter in the, in the constitutional and the juristic sense. Number one, it is a certification by an executive nominee that the departing disqual allegedly disqualified members, allegedly by me, are kosher. They are not disqualified. They are not disqualified is his confidence. Number two, that you, Mr. Udha, is not the Sh Shiva Sena, but those people are. He's writing to Udha Thakre. Three, he is doing it under the nose of a pending disqualification, then scheduled proceeding and a hotly contested Supreme Court matter. The ordinary mortals were doing it, the Lordship take a very serious view. I know the Lordship can't issue directions to the governor and content may not lie. But because consider, Manos, if anybody else would write a letter like this, when your Lordship is hearing such a heavily contested matter and the, 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 the speaker is dealing with it, I don't know, Manos, normally Manos, we'd expect some contempt notice. Then some appropriate case will to examine how far the arc of immunity applies. Number four.
he is Malus actually setting up the ground as a precursor. Come to me, I will swear you in. This is an advanced intimation. Malus, this seventh para read as it is can only say, Come to me, I am ready to swear you in. Because you are kosher. There is no problem with you, there is no stigma. Only step left is that, nothing is left. Therefore, Malitz, to the other question, my Lord, the Honorable Chief Justice asked me on Thursday, Malitz, what should, what is it that you want us to do in the event that we agree with you? Lord, she put a question like that. One of the simplest levels, of course, I gave you lots of larger answers, simplest levels to quash this letter. Now, suppose your Lordship quashes his letter, just for a minute. And I do not press, except for one or two other things, in any meaningful way for other things. Just suppose, I'm just not conceding anything, I'm just giving the Lordship a supposition. The status quo is automatically restored. Lordship doesn't have to say it. And is that constitutional morality? Is that fair play? Is that for us upholding the greatest traditions of governance? Because clearly it is. And certainly, Malutz, there can be no bar, immunity, hesitation, legal obstacle, constitutional bar from quashing this letter, if you are otherwise agrees with me. This letter is not a non quashable document, Malutz. It's directly impugned. It's a direct prayer, directly impugned in all the repetition or many of the repetitions. Take it, brothers. Take it that it's impugned. I don't know if you should take out the prayer. No, no, not from here. So, now, Malitz, this is the fourth consequence. The fifth is a obvious consequence of this consequence. Next step is swearing, which happens on. 30th. 30th. This is 28th, 30th. In fact, the seeds of that are very clear in Para 7. I told you it's an advanced intimation. It happens two days later. So that's a letter saying you are kosher. That is what is acting on the letter and giving you a constitutional status of a minister. Well, in fact, I'm sorry, that swearing in was a chief minister. 30th was a swearing of Mr. Shinde. Chief minister, correct. 38th. 30th. So you are swearing in a constitutional head of state. And what is the last consequence is again consequential to the consequence, which is appointment of the speaker. If I may say the new speaker or the speaker. Thank you. I have given a lordship six consequences. I mean, one can make probably seven or eight also, but let's say six. Well, as my respectful submission is A, that these are serious consequences, extremely serious for our constitutional polity. B, they are case neutral to the present case. They are extremely serious for our constitutional polity. B, they are case neutral from this present case. They are juristic questions and they are bound to recur unless your Lordship plugs the loophole this way or that way. Third, these are all within your Lordship's judicial domain. None of this is a no-go area. Fourth, and this is very important, 
Fourth, only your lordships. I'm not saying lordships may. I'm saying only your lordships can decide and should decide this. I'm not even making an optional rule. According to me, this is only the Honorable Supreme Court. Which can and should decide it here. Not delegated to any other authority. No. Then Mullins, these are this is the main point already. And then of course it follows that your lordship would Mullins as an ancillary because your lordship passes ancillary yes, now says well, it's just two minutes now. But I have one question, but I don't want to disturb your lordship. No, Mullis, I, I I'll just take about ten minutes more. I'm going to make some. So Mullis, your lordship will therefore restore in the ancillary sense the position as on twenty seventh or such such date. That is because ultimately your lordship's orders are not Mullis Pariks. They have to have an effect. That effect has to be only that restoration. To restore position as on? 27th August, uh, uh, June. That is, this is 28th, so 27th is one day before. Now, I'm just coming back to my note, and I'll be very quick with that's written down. Come to para 12. This is the other facet. I your lordship stopped at twelve thirteen last time. Just come to para twelve of my note. Where you? A three, A three. The one your lordship was using. Now, what is the point? And I'll be very quick for this. Purposive interpretation in tenth schedule legislature cases, your lordship is repeated, repeated, and repeated many times. Which page, Dr. Singh? Para 12 of my note, page 5. This is that A3 note. Oh, I see. It's page 7. Page 7? Page 7. In your lordship, it's maybe page 7. Yes. Now, Malus, purposive interpretation, what was this new fashion? Of course, now it's old. Menian calls teleological approach. Yes. What is it? Ah, it is his purpose. Para 12 commences by saying it is further sub respectfully submitted. That the above course, the next line is purposive interpretation. Right. Or your lordship calls it teleological approach. One of the most abstract books, follows that many and very difficult to read. <laughs> now, let's just see what is that purposive interpretation? These are the principles. Why does your lordship talk of the evil of political defections? Next para. Now, it will be very brief. Kehoto quoted well known to your lordships. Kehoto in para 4 cites the statement of objects and then says this, I am reading, the evil of political defection has been a matter of national concern, not combated, likely to undermine the very foundations of our democracy and the principles which sustain it. With this object, an assurance was given in the address by the President to Parliament that the government intended to introduce in the current session of Parliament an anti-defection bill. The bill is meant for outgoing defection. Why are you not saying all this in Kyoto, which is 20 years ago, 30 years ago? It's 30 years ago. Because this says that when you interpret anything in this area, you must push this sentiment, this object. That's the object of this. Next, Jagjit Singh. Just see this, fellas. Jagjit Singh, all the citations are given. I'll not go to it. I'll just read it from my notebooks. The validity of the orders by the Speaker under 2 2 disqualifying certain independent MLAs of Haryana three days prior to the election for the Rajya Sabha fell for consideration. Now, she knows in the Rajya Sabha, the MLAs vote for this. <coughs> This Honorable Court rejected an argument that the Speaker's order had been passed in haste, observing that the disqualified MLAs were interested in prolonging the disqualification proceedings beyond the date of Rajya Sabha. Critically, it was held that an independent MLA cannot be avoided, permitted to avoid the consequence of defection merely by not completing the formalities of joining a political party. So this was not, uh, this was only by purpose of interpretation. This was extending and stretching, if I may use the cruder word, stretching it but stretching it for the purpose of promoting this object. Of course, it's an irony. There, you did it to, well, they said, we will prolong the disqualification so he can't vote. Yeah, I said, he can vote in the Raj Sabha. Here, well, it's the same man, where is Chief Minister? If Jagjit Singh is right, well, this is a 10 times a for sure I case which we are arguing now. That was only a Raj Sabha election. 
Now, 29 is what the Supreme Court says. It is also essential to bear in mind the objects, underline the word objects, for enacting the defection law, namely to curb the menace for defection. Despite defection, a member cannot be permitted to get away with it without facing the consequences of such defection only because of mere technicalities. The substance and spirit of law is the guiding factor to decide whether an elected member has joined or not joined a political party after his election. It would not be a validity, etc. I'll skip that. Now see Rajendra Rana, Constitution Bench, well-known case. But it was decided on the basis of purposive interpretation. There were gaps. The Lordship had to fill the gaps. The Lordship resorted to purposive interpretation. Kindly see that. This Honorable Court rejected an argument that the initial defection by 13. So this is a two-part defection. Initial was 13. Followed by a subsequent claim by 37 MLAs that there was a split in the BSP in terms of para 3 meant that there was no disqualification of the initial 13 MLA. Now, this is a good old days of a split existing. Even then, look at the way your Lordship interpreted it. Your Lordship had the split existing, but see how you interpreted it, by purposive. The court applied the principle of purposive interpretation to hold the disqualification occurs on the date when the acts attracting disqualification are committed. Therefore, the question of disqualification, whether there had been a split, had to be determined to the initial date, not the subsequent date. Thus, the defense to the plea of disqualification cannot be a subsequent defense and must have arisen at the time when the acts constituting the disqualification were committed. Now, just read two marked portions. I'll not read the whole one. If you're actually permit me, the first six lines of 33 only. It may be that the collective dissent is not intended to be stifled by the enactment of 1022. But at the same time, it is clear that the object, mark the word object, is to discourage defection which has assumed menacing proportions, undermining the very basis of democracy. Well, the very basis of democracy comes close to basic structure. Democracy has been held to be basic, basic structure already, even, obviously. Therefore, a purposive interpretation in para 2 in juxtaposition of 3 and 4 is called for. Therefore, therefore, then well, one thing is clear, the defection is the ground for disqualifying a member. He incurs the disqualification if he is voluntarily given a membership of his original political party, meaning that the party on whose ticket he got elected. In the case of defense of a whip, I'll skip that to save time. Come to the next marked portion, next para, the highlighted portion. The fact that a decision in this regard may be taken in the case of voluntary giving up by the speaker at a subsequent point of time cannot and does not postpone the incurring of disqualification by the act of the legislator. Similarly, the fact that the party could condone, could theoretically, there's a para which allows you to condone, the defiance of a whip within 15 days or that the speaker takes the decision only thereafter cannot also pitch the time of disqualification as anything other than the point at which the whip is defied. I'm not only arguing, well, relating back. I'm arguing purposive interpretation, apart from relating back. Relating back is arri arrived at by um, adopting purposive interpretation. Therefore, in the background of the object sought to be achieved by the 52nd Amendment and on a true understanding of para 2, with reference to other para, the position that emerges is that the speaker has to decide the question of disqualification with reference to the date on which a member voluntarily gives up his membership or defies the whip. That is arrived in a purpose of interpretation. No other way. It is really a decision ex post facto. The fact that in terms of para 6, a decision on the question has to be taken by the speaker or the chairman cannot lead to a conclusion that the question has to be determined only with reference to the date of the decision of the speaker. An interpretation of that nature would leave the disqualification to an indeterminate point of time to the whims of the decision-making authority. Same would defeat the very object of enacting the law. Well, as by disabling notice to a speaker, you will achieve the same. By the speaker, the governor writing letters will achieve the same. All these are nullifying the tense schedule. That's why purposive interpretation is vital. Your Honour has separately noted with me paras 12, 52, and 53 of Rana. That is done in the earlier department. I argue that's not quoted here. Now, Mr. Shrivant Balaji Patel, the Balasa Patel, in para 89, which is quoted, just come to the bold face alone to save time. So I'm skipping long paras in between. If we hold that the disqualification proceedings would become infructuous upon tendering resignation, now this is another technique, Mr. Because Malas, if you if you are disqualified, then Malas, you have to fight an election again to become a minister. Well, if you are disqualified, you must fight an election again to become a minister. So people will just resign and then immediately become a minister. Then you get six months. 
to be elected. You can become a minister now, need not be elected for a while. So to get around that, this is well as your logical purpose of interpretation. If we hold that the disqualification proceedings would become infectious upon tendering resignation, any member who is on the verge of being disqualified would immediately resign and would escape the sanctions provided under 751, 164 and 361. These are remuneration consequences and also most importantly that you have to, uh, uh, you can be a minister but be elected within six months after that. That is not available if you are disqualified. Such an interpretation would therefore not only be against the intent behind the introduction of the 10th schedule, but also defeat the spirit of the 91st Amendment. Then, well as DTC, an inhibition under the Constitution, this is of course not a defection case, but on the principle of purposive, an inhibition under the Constitution must be interpreted so as to give a wider interpretation to cure the existing evils. Now, this is important, even though it's not highlighted, just read this paragraph, 118. Legislation, both statutory and constitutional, are enacted and true from experience of evils, but in general language should not therefore be confined to the form that an evil had taken. Time works changes, brings into existence new conditions and purposes and new awarenesses of limitations. Therefore, a principle to be valid must be capable of wider application than the mischief which gave it birth. It was born for reason X, today our Lordship will expand it to Y, tomorrow to Z, because we learn from experience, brothers. As they said, well, it's not spirit of law, not logic, but experience. Those famous words of Holmes, Holmes, Holmes. This is, therefore, a principle to be valid must be given wider application of mischief it gave it birth. This is particularly true of constitutional constructions. Constitutions are not ephemeral enactments designed to meet passing occasions. These are, to use the words of Chief Justice Marshall, designed to approach immortality as nearly as human institutions can approach it. Between the two occur Karna Mahalo.
Není, ale... If second character to him. Yes, sir. The last two lines above para 91 in my in my uh, note, which is para 16 at the end of in the application of a constitutional limitation on inhibition. Our interpretation cannot be only of what has been, but of what may be. Hello, has got that correct? What is here? Well, it's in, in within 16, I have quoted judgments. In the quotation, there is a para 91, two lines above 91. Oh, uh, yes. Then, well, it's next 91, I will not read your Lordship has it, but it's coming out of your Lordship's ears, this judgment, five days your Lordship heard this. Only one sentence I'm emphasizing, which was not relevant for the other case. I mean, I didn't argue it there. This is a quotation, well, last line of 284. The courts must adopt such an interpretation which glorifies the democratic spirit of the constitution. I'll skip once. All of 17, I'll skip. 18 is a very important paragraph, but I have in a different way covered it factually. It includes an overlap with the consequences argument. All the facts are itemized there. So I'll skip it once to save time. 18. A lot of seen my 18. You also just keep it as a factual summary. Now come to 20. Allowing the disqualification petition to be decided by a person who has been appointed a speaker with the active support of the respondents and who has condu conducted himself in a biased and malafide manner would result in incentivizing the constitutional sin of defection. That's the phrase I want to comment for your Lordship's consideration. Incentivizing the constitutional sin of defection and would be against the spirit and intent behind the ten schedule. The same would be the teeth of constitutional morality. Thus, the principle of purposive interpretation demands that the present speaker not be inter uh, interested. This fellas ends the purposive part. Then para 22 is fellas an interesting point and not merger. Just see the irony here. Your lordships has only one defense fellas apart from condonation of merger. Merger is, is the supreme irony in this case. Merger is not even alleged by them, claimed by them, raised by them. In case of a merger, suppose 8 out of 10, 6 out of 10, 9 out of 10 leave, the remaining chap left behind is protected. Under your lordship, 10 schedule is protected. He otherwise was he's a, he's a loner. He would himself be well as he's protected. Here, well as, but for lordship's interim order, which we argued just a few days ago, I'm not protected. Without claiming merger, I mean, as well as today, they are issuing letters and whips, which, well as, I'm not talking about lordship's protection. The whip is being issued as we speak, well as, in, in various places, they are tied if the EC has recognized them. But for lordship's protection, I would be liable to be disqualified for not following his whip. Because without invoking merger, without getting a merger, well, as, there is no protection. They have become the party. These are malus consequences. This is a consequence of Lordship. I added my six consequences. This is a very weird consequence. It's a very weird consequence. If you have the defense of a constitution, you are worse off. If you don't take the defense of a constitution, you are better off. 
I should have mentioned in the constituency list, Lord Shabir, consider putting it there. It's an absolutely absurd, weird consequence. Then, brothers, I have extracted para 4 in para 23, that is para 4 of the 10th schedule. And I've made this point in para 24 again. And therefore, Malus, I have ended with this. I'm ending my submissions with one Malus judgment which I have to cite. That's an absolute end. That's an interesting judgment on Malus. Where is it found? Where is it? 3F. Compilation of judgments. 3F. Volume. 3F. 3F. It's a judgment called Indore Development Authority 2028 SCC 129. Constitution. Constitution Bench. On restitution. Uh, on restitution. Ah, yes. Your Lordship is a party to it. Restitution, no? Restitution. Because that's the fifth facet or sixth facet of well, setting right a wrong. Well, you, you call it actus curiae. Your Lordship will not allow your Lordship's acts or judgments to harm a party. Your Lordship calls it well, a situation created by a Lordship's order, etc. Another facet of saying the same thing is restitution. And my Lord is absolutely right. Which page you want to read? This fellas is in this volume 3F at PDF page One minute. 33. One minute. Starts at 33 is the PDF page of volume 3F. And the citation of indoor development is 2020 8 SCC 129. 33. 33. Para? So the first para I wish to read is far away from the beginning. It's para 335 at page. Oh, 335. Yes, 335. At page? At page 275. PDF page 275. The, may I read it, brothers? The page of the PDF is 275. Yes. My lords have got it. The principle of restitution is founded on the ideal of doing complete justice at the end of the litigation. I emphasize the word complete justice and I emphasize the word restitution. And parties have to be placed in the same position but for, that's the, I said the word but for test, but for the litigation and the interim order. These are very, very important words on the constitution bench. But for, that's the test. But for the litigation and interim order, if any passed in the matter. In southeastern coal fields, it was held that no party could take advantage of litigation. It has to disgorge the advantage gained due to delay in case the list is lost. The interim order passed by the court merges into a final decision. The validity of an interim order passed in favor of a party stands reversed in the event of a final order going against the party successful at the interim stage. Section 144 of the CPC is not the fountain a source of restitution. It is rather a statutory recognition of the rule of justice, equity, and fair play. The court has inherent jurisdiction to order restitution so as to do complete justice. This is also on the principle that a wrongdoer should not be perpetuated, sorry, wrong order, not wrongdoer, wrong order should not be perpetuated by keeping it alive and respecting it. In exercise of such power, the courts have applied the principle of restitution to myriad situations not falling within the terms of 144. What attracts applicability of restitution is not the act of the court being wrongful or mistake. So this is apart from actus curiamens or an error committed by the court. The test is whether on account of an act of the party persuading the court to pass an order held at the end is not sustainable resulting in one party gaining an advantage which it would not have otherwise earned or the other party having suffered an impoverishment. It's very well put for us. I would commend for us all, each word of this. Litigation cannot be permitted to be a productive industry. That is only a fond hope. It is a productive industry. Litigation cannot be reduced to gaming where there is an element of chance in every case. If the concept of restitution is excluded from application, to interim orders, then the litigant would stand to gain by swallowing the benefits yielding out of the interim order. Then they quote, I will not read the quotation. Just pause here for th five seconds, brothers. I get an interim order. The interim order is obviously not confirmed. If the, if the interim order is confirmed, the matter doesn't arise. It is other way around. 
but every consequence of the interim order is enjoyed, gorged, eaten, and then you twiddle your thumbs and say, tough luck, now the final order has come too late, you can't ask for restitution. That is what your lordship seek to address by this passage. It's rather well put. For saving of time, I'm not reading. I would request my lords to read Eastern Coalfields from where it draws strength. It's a constitution bench. And Malus, this is the essence of justice. It's the essence of justice. In a constitutional matter with such grave consequences, it is even Malus a for sure. I'm very deeply obliged. Just one question I had, and it's a tax part. Uh, you said, you know, and both Ms. Sibyl also said the same thing, that this is not a case where a trust court is called when the house is constituted for the first time. Because the governor's power, of course, the governor has the power to call for a trust court when there is no clear majority under the law. But not after the election that you have for the right, first time. It's not after the election because here the government has been formed. Very bad point that, you know, this post-formation of government. What is the power of the governor to call for a trust vote post formation of the government? What are the circumstances in which he can? That means a running government. A running government. Correct. Well, let's, uh, let me answer on first principles. That we, of course, we can add some material and give a lot of specifically a note only on this. But, well, on first principles, the first answer is that zero, where, because well, a lot of people decide abstract. Zero answer to lawsuit, direct question, direct answer. Zero power where there are pending disqualification issues in a running government. Because lawsuit should not mix up the two. One is a normal vanilla running government with no issue of disqualification. One is well, a disqualification pending at two levels. My candid, clear answer to your lawsuit, direct question is zero. Number two, the reason is what I have given, Malas. It is a Lateral entry of the executive in an area where there cannot be any jurisdiction. There's no locus for this. In either 10 schedule or lots of jurisdiction. Right. Number three, if well as, your lordship's question is premised, has to be premised and rightly premised on the assumption that the governor, what he does in the question posed by the Honorable Chief Justice, what is he doing, well as? He's recognizing ABC as the inverted commas majority. There is no relevance to your lordship's query unless the Wallace governor does that. Otherwise, your lordship's query would not be Wallace relevant. Obviously, it be supposed that he is giving some Malus imparting legitimacy, recognition, or some status. Malus, how is that possible? There's only one. In constitutional law, it's not possible. Now, not so much from the facts of this case, where you know we're looking at now the yes. perspective. On the facts, I'll tell lordship. That letter of the 28th of June 2022, yeah. Yeah. the governor, Lord Balco, you said that what the governor essentially did was to recognize the split yes. by the letter. In fact, the letter does say that so many people have left you and therefore, you know, that. Without you, the word split is a full recognition, my submission to the De facto recognition of a split. Yes. yes. Right. Now, your answer to that is that the governor, so long as the disqualification petition petitions are pending, he cannot call for a trust vote for the same reason that you are still a part then of the government which is supported in the House of Form. Except in one case, yes. where well, for some freak reason which I cannot think of, it never happened, that nobody decides to seek to disqualify the other. Hmm. Now, well, suppose. Often the speaker, what he may do is that to no, no, no. disqualify you at all. No, but that is not so simple. Contribute to the majority of the no, I am giving a juristic. I am giving a juristic answer to your lordship's query. It can never arise in practice, but I am giving a juristic answer. That will have to be a situation where there is no malus cavil and dispute. I mean, it is virtually malus uh, by consent of everybody. But with that answer comes a caveat. It goes back to the origin and the object of the tenth schedule. Why was it enacted? It was enacted not to encourage these trust board situations by defections. Unless, just come, no, unless that is so, it will rise every week, every two one weeks. The last point, one of the last points, maybe we can take two minutes yes. to put this to the other side also. Yes. The worry I, I, there's no clear answer. No, I'm very grateful because it helps us no. to, to clarify in our own minds also. Which is to clarify. Yes. Yes. One, 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 last are, there is, in, in assessing the, the strength of a ruling party in the House, whether it's a legislative assembly or a parliament, you have a numerator and you have a denominator. The numerator represents the strength 
of the party when the house was formed. The denominator represents the total percent of the house. Now, by calling for a trust vote on 28th of June 2022, the governor, according to you, your argument is that the governor therefore recognizes that a part of the numerator has evaporated or has been taken away. It's rather nice for putting a numerator. Yeah, yes. The numerator has been taken away. <laughs> And therefore, now I feel you have lost the confidence in the house. According to you, that is not permissible because the disqualification is still pending. And he recognizes and gives legitimacy to the numerator. In your lost example, he is recognizing and giving legitimacy to the numerator. The only problem which yeah. I think, you know, which we just said or not, uh, which is uh, yes, yes. which is worrying is, does yes. the governor not also recognize that the very act by which the numerator may or may not be affected? All right. For instance, the numerator would be affected even if you don't treat it as a split, and there's a clear disqualification. Then the numerator is reduced by x, the strength of the ruling party in the house, minus y, the people who are defected from. Yes. Where they therefore attain disqualification. But if we that same man affects the denominator also. Because it reduces the total strength. The total strength of the house. Correct. Right. So, though the governor cannot therefore say, the governor cannot legitimately say that, look, these people have left you, therefore I want to trust. Correct. But can the governor not then say that, look, assuming that they have, they, they, there is no recognizable concept of a split now under the 10th schedule, the effect of all this is that these people have to be reduced both from the numerator and the straight away, straight away. There are many answers. There are many answers. First, this exercise cannot be done by the governor because there is no need for it generally. You have been arguing that he can't assume to himself to take a decision. First, we have lost you three or four answers. Lost you note down. My very specific answer. This is an exercise itself very which he cannot embark on. The governor has no such jurisdiction to embark upon when there's a running house. Now, second answer. Right. He can't exercise yes. embark. But can you not, therefore, they then say, I want this exercise to be demonstrated on the floor? No, of the no I'm saying that exercise you can't embark on. Let me answer. Tell you. Tell me not. Yeah, I'll yes. answer. He has yes. argued that. He second has answer. argued that he won't have the. It has to be. Huh? Whereas, numerator and denominator. You can't start because well, your lordship has to premise a direction by me to him. I am the governor, I am giving him a direction. So in other words, stop please have the argument. You can't give a direction. What your point? Therefore, to the legislature, the speaker, or the chief minister can say, sorry, I don't know where this direction. I don't know where this direction. your argument, therefore, yes. until the outcome of the disqualification petitions is known to the governor, exactly. he cannot then call no, for a trust. Two or three. Lordship, possibly, possibly. Yes. possibly Using your uh, line of argument, we're just trying to understand the yes. administration to its conclusion. After the disqualification petitions are decided by the speaker, then there is clarity in the mind of the governor on what is the extent of the numerator which has been affected. I'm very grateful. I was going to answer. I'm not conceding, but I was going to answer because that question will arise. Not sure we'll be very careful about a hypothetical situation, but possibly, were. but who is fighting that? Because a constitutional designated judicial or quasi judicial tribunal has given a verdict. After that, there is something, as a lot of puts it, that verdict, unless disturbed by the High Court or the Supreme Court, is binding or operating. But here, your lordship's query answers the first part. Also you are doing it well before. You say another point in your favor, actually, which is that the very same unit. Which affects the numerator yeah. affects the denominator also. Yes, yes, right. Yes. So if the governor cannot postulate until the disqualification petitions have ended yeah. that the numerator has been affected, then he cannot say that the denominator no, is affected. No, no, he cannot. By the way, arithmetic has to be both. It, it is very selective otherwise. Right. Is it because the same act so, of defection which reduces the strength absolute, of the ruling party, absolute. which also then affects the strength of the house. And what is, can you can you start doing this? A pre, this is the word premature stares your lordship in the face. Constitution says this body will decide. This body is elected to decide. You want to give a decision virtually. I will reduce the denominator, I will the numerator, numerator. Well, that will create chaos. And Malitz, well, your lordship has to see Malitz well, the. You, you are saying so the, you can't take cognizance of the existence of the 10th schedule proceedings. Uh, he can take only upon an order passed by. Consequence of the 10th schedule proceedings. After a determination by the 10th schedule. That's a very pithy summary. 
the consequence of the train schedule can be some basis unless disturbed by the High Court or Supreme Court to act. Until then, they continue to be members of the... Party. And it would be in red. Once they're, 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 Otherwise, it would be, this would be really a method... There'll be chaos. There'll be chaos. And unless, I mean, not that it should come into your house, your house. It cannot, because ignore the reality, because of around the country, governors also. We got your yeah, answer. Governors are no more angels. So just two sentences. Number one, Malaj. Ten schedule doesn't recognize majority minority. Absolutely. No, but correct? Not correct. Ten schedule postulates, Malaj, that even if there is a split of a majority, it can't be recognized. The governor knows that. The governor knows that, Malaj. Gov and Malaj, ten schedule also, para three also said there must be a split in the original political party. Then schedule Maras Para 3 said original political. Right. We know that there was no split. Governor knows there was no split in the original political party. So on what basis will he ever recognize? And your answer to your Lordship's question, how will the governor call Malaj? Supposing one of the parties moves away from the coalition and goes to the governor along with the BJP and says, now we are. That's not an individual act of defense. Yes, that's the that, That's right. So this is an individual act. It has to be the act of a party. Now, you have recognized the majority as the party and writing a letter to the chief minister. This is unheard of. So, if a party says we don't support the government anymore, yes. that's not a disqualification. That's right. correct. We don't support the governor. You've lost one of your constituents. Now government calls. Yes. That's fine. That's all that's right. So, that, I'm sorry. It was right. Didn't want to. Very deeply obliged. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Uh, Wait, please, for some words, I'll be very brief, man. Plus for 15, 20 minutes. Okay. But uh, some issues have not been covered. What are the points that you want? Yes, yeah. straight away. Plots, I have made a brief written note. But before I come to the note, Malam, but I have made a chart of all the prayers for your lordships. And one or two areas which have not been addressed, if your lordships have that chart, which has not the list of four red petitions on this side and two red petitions on that side, this document A. Document A? Yes, Malam. It's a chart. Document 8 launched, consolidated prayers. Signed yesterday. The serial number 1 and 2 are read petitions filed by my learned friends. Not challenging the notice issued by the speaker. First one. Yes, no, the first two, but that was the uh, subject matter of 27th order. Now, Lord, item number 3 is a read petition challenging the action of the governor, calling for the trust vote. Now, that has also been addressed you know, at length. That is item number three. Now, my lords, serial number five at page five is a read petition by us, challenging a decision of the speaker on 3rd July 2022, after his election. Changing the recognition of the whip from Sunil Prabhu to Milor Mr. Gogawe. But this is a area which has not been addressed, which I will not uh, briefly not touch upon. Serial number six, Milor, relates to the actions of the governor, Lords, in administering oath to Shinde, and also, Milor, that whether your lordship should decide the disqualification petitions here. And lastly, my lord, serial number seven challenges, my lord, notices of disqualification issued to us. Now, my lord, I will limit myself, my lord, to the challenge of 3rd of July, 2022. And this challenge, my lord, is an independent challenge, irrespective of the view which your lord will ultimately take as far as disqualification is concerned or governor's Malod's, uh, actions are concerned. Now kindly have a look at the writ petition itself, Malod. The writ petition starts. What is that writ petition number? Yes, Malod. That writ petition is 479 of 2022. Yes. Starts at Malod 470 PDF. Common compilation one. Four zero six. Four zero six. No. 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 Four six. Common compilation.
सिक्स में लौटा सॉरी फोर जीरो सिक्स कम्युनिकेशन ऑफ थर्ड ऑफ जुलाई ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू and the grounds taken are not that the speaker could not have acted on the request of the legislature party the speaker is obliged only to act on the directions of the political party as far as para 21b is concerned the decision of the speaker yeah, itself not have acted on the not not it's not picked down any notes it's there in my notes on the advice of the legislature yes that's right i'll just show the documents not in straight away come to the note if your lordships have the decision of the speaker which is of 3rd of july my lord at pdf lot 382 cc2 of the same volume of cc i'm sorry my cc2 which one my lord cc2 page 382 of the convenience volume 52 serial number 5 serial number 5 the running page is 369 pdf page 382 your lordships are aware not this decision is taken after the election of the speaker you know on third on the late night of third so kindly see what he says you know just one second i am just trying to track it down convenience compilation to right yeah page page 382 i'm sorry 382 with reference to your above mentioned letter i have been ordered to inform you that you have been replaced from the post of legislature party by nominating the name of ajay choudhury in this regard you have raised the objection by addressing the letter on 22nd june in this regard after deliberation on provision in the law honorable speaker maharashtra legislative assembly has cancelled the approval granted to ajay choudhury as the leader shiv sena legislature party and kindly see the next lot and approves the recognition recognize the nomination of eknath shinde as the leader shiv sena legislature party similarly the proposal to nominate sunil prabhu as the chief of shiv sena legislature legislature party is to be cancelled and to recognize the nomination of bharat gogavle as chief whip of shiv sena legislature party has been approved and recorded in the registry so my lord my argument is limited to the second part of the decision cancellation as far as my lord the replacement of sunil prabhu by my lord bharat gogavle by the action of the speaker on the third and the only material my lord which was there before the speaker was that letter of 22nd of june of my lord mr shinde which your lordships have seen my lord pdf my lord page 67 it was lordships have seen that which encloses that resolution my lord of 21st appointing my lord sunil prabhu can you give us a cross reference yes my lord that is page 60 no no the earlier of this b 67 the the letter my lord of uh, mr shinde to the honorable deputy speaker is at page 67 if your lordship just have a look at that page 67 it, at the same compilation yes my lord kindly see my lord the heading it is not by a political party shiv sena vidhi mandal paksh karyalay clear my lord that the letter was addressed by the shiv sena legislature party at best and this my lord is based 
on the resolution which was passed in Gawati. Which is, my lord, that resolution at page 49. 62. At, my lord, PDF page 62, again, Shiv Sena Vithi Mandal Paksh Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Uh, PDF page 55. Again, the heading is also Shiv Sena. Yes, my lord. Page, uh, PDF page 55, Shiv Sena Vidhi Mandal Paksh Karyal. Now, the defense to this, in the reply, there are only two defenses taken, which your lordship, my lord, have to consider. One, is this, a, this is an issue which is covered by 212. Courts should not get into it. And second, in any event, it is the legislature party which decides the whip. Straight away, my lord, if I can place the reply itself, there are only two issues, my lord, which have been raised in the reply. Kindly turn to my lord's PDF page 475 of Convenience Volume 1. Page 475. If your lordships have page 475, Sorry, which convenience compilation, please? One. Convenience one. volume one. Lots, I have to call this in the note. The lots may not be troubled enough to make the. Why don't you take us pages. run through that note rather? Yeah, yes, yes, no, I'll just point out the pages and tell you. Yes, sir. While you read it, you can. I will. I will. Indicate. Yes, sir. Lots, if your lots have page 475 PDF, they are replying lots to this writ petition. The. Second column, my lord, from the top. This is the answer to 479. Writ petition is not maintainable uh, in view of 212. And in any event, speaker has no discretion in the matter and has to notify the will of the majority of the legislature party. The lordships have made a note, my lord. Similar, my lord's averments are made at PDF, my lord's. 492, paragraph 35, 34, 35, and 36. Yes, so, my lord, these are the documents which I wanted to show. Now, straight away, my lord, if your lordships come to my note, your notice, my lord, that is A2, my lord. A2, it's called additional WS. Devdutt, your A1 is about the seven judge issue, I think. Yes, no, that's right. Correct. A2. Lots at page, PDF page two, my lord. The first point that as far as the validity of this decision is concerned, it's only your lordships, lords who can take a view on this. And if your lordships kindly see paragraph 8 and 9, this issue on my lord whether the whip is to be issued by the political party or legislature party, not my senior colleagues have already made a lot of submissions. I will not repeat it. Paragraph 8, my lord, I've extracted 2B. And 9, my lords, I have given the reference to my lord Mr. Sibyl's submission, where not detail or skin may, etc. Whether it's clear my lord, that whip has to be issued by the political party and not by my lord, uh, the legislature party. Now, my lords, coming to the defenses raised in the writ petition, if your lordships have paragraph 12. Paragraph 12, my lords, I have extracted 212. If your lordship sees 212, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's the paucity of time, my lords, I'm trying to hurry up. Yes. Lord's paragraph 12, 212 I have extracted. The first Lord's criteria for 212 to kick in is that the validity of any proceedings in the legislature of a state shall not be called into question. So my submission is, Lord, that the decision of the speaker 
of 3rd of July 2022 is not a proceeding in the legislature of the state. And my lords, I am fortified my lord, by Mohammed Siddiqui's case, which I have extracted in the next uh, paragraph. Paragraph 34. The above proposition makes it clear that the finality of the decision of the speaker and the proceedings of the state legislature being important privilege of the state legislature, etc. The proceeding of the legislatures include everything said or done in the house in the transaction of parliamentary business. Now, my lords, deciding a whip or giving recognition to a whip has nothing to do, my lords, with parliamentary business. Therefore, the primary, my lords, ingredient of 212 is not satisfied. Second, my lords, is a more fundamental argument that this is not a mere my lords, case of procedural irregularity, but a case of substantive illegality and unconstitutionality. Your Lord Jesus, my Lord, from time and again said that 212 will not my lords, help the speaker's decision to be immune from judicial review if it suffers from substantive illegality or unconstitutionality, even if it is proceedings in the house. Lord, the latest judgment here extracts the constitution bent judgment in Raja Rampa. <clears throat> and if I can just place my Lord, paragraph 431 of Raja Rampa, which is extracted at page my Lord, 6, PDF 6. Conclusion, my lord, S, bottom of that page. The proceeding which may be tainted on account of substantive or gross illegality or unconstitutionality are not protected from judicial scrutiny. Then similarly, my lord, you an ouster clause attaching finality to a determination does not oust the power of judicial review, but not on grounds of lack of jurisdiction or it being nullity for some such reason as gross illegality, irrationality, violation of constitutional mandates. Yes. yes. Now, my lords, as far as my lord, the decision is concerned, that this is not a procedural irregularity, but a substantive illegality or unconstitutionality is borne by a plain reading, my lords, of paragraph two of the 10th schedule. And my lords, all the authorities and material which has already been relied upon, lord, that references I have given, if your lordships have paragraph nine, my lord, I've given the references page 70 to 96. Paragraph 9, page 4 of this note, and I will not, will not repeat it. Now, not the second point. Third heading in my note. What is the meaning, my lords, of a political party? The lordships asked, my lord, during the course of our submissions. What does it mean? Now, my lords, I have tried to explain because ultimately decisions of a political party, which I will demonstrate, my lord, are ultimately decisions of the political party expressed through its leadership. And when, my lords, 2B talks about directions of the political party, it means decisions of the political party as are communicated, my lords, the speaker. Now, my lords, kindly have paragraph 19 of my note. The 10th schedule of the constitution prescribes, I'm sorry, prescribes a code of prohibited conduct of for legislatures within and outside the house. Any commission of the prohibited conduct by a legislature envisages penalty of disqualification. Now, Lord, there are two categories of prohibited conduct which your lordships have seen, my lord. And the footnote will show, my lord, I'm not going to repeat it. What is prohibited conduct for the purpose of para 21A? I have given the references also. Resignation need not be 
plots explicit, it can be inferred, giving a letter to the governor, plots going to the uh, governor with the opposition parties constitute para 2 and a. All the references are there. Now, I want the substantive submission on the term political party, if your lordships have paragraph 21 now. It's not a nebulous concept. The term political party occurring in the 10th schedule is not a nebulous concept, but a term which has a definite connotation. The term political party referred to in the 10th schedule is an association body of persons which has a definite leadership structure which is recognized by the Election Commission of India under Section 29A of the RPI. A political party is not synonymous with its legislators. A political party includes in its ambit the entire organizational structure which is spread at several levels, block level, taluka, district and state level, apart from the primary members holding those posts. Your lordships have seen, Malo, as far as Shiv Sena was concerned, organizational elections were held in 2018 and the leadership structure was communicated in January of 2018. Malo, the documents your lordships have seen, I'm not going to uh, point it out again. But those documents unequivocally show not who's the leadership of the political party. That is page one Malo, of the of convenience compilation two. Now, Malo, there is the how this concept my lord of political party was included. What is the history? I will not trouble your lordships with that. If your lordship straight away have now 29A, which is extracted in para 28. Malo. Why this is important? Is that political party you know, is not something which is anomalous. It is very clear who are the members, what is the leadership structure. So when the 10th schedule says directions of the political party, it means the directions of the political party as is expressed through the political leadership of that party. Paragraph 28, you know, 29A is extracted. If your lordships have PDF page 12, subsection 4 of 29A clearly states that the application shall contain the details of the president, secretary, treasurer, and other office bearers. So the leadership structure what has to be intimated to the election commission. Now, my lords, detailed guidelines have been made in the Article 324 under Section 29A. And that also, my lord, is a part of uh, this very uh, written submission. If your lordships, my lord, just have PDF page 21, it requires, my lord, the following documents to be submitted, which includes office bearers. The lordships may kindly make a note in at page 22, and also, my lord, affidavits to be given by the president and secretary which is my lot PDF page 34. So therefore, my lot coming back to my note, my lot, paragraph 30. The fact that Sri Uddhav Thakre is the president of the party as per the constitution of the party was intimated to the election commission from time to time. Thus, the terminus of court for deciding a disqualification petition under the 10th schedule in regard to the prohibited conduct of a legislature has to be with reference to the state of affairs of that political party as it existed on the date of alleged action of disqualification. The term political party in the 10th schedule is referable to the political party as registered and recognized by the ECI under section 29A. Now, my lord, sir, the next section that the 10th schedule is intended to maintain the integrity of the political party, my lord, your lordships sir, uh, have been taken through it. I will not, uh, my lord, sir, trouble your lordships with that. If your lordships now have serial number 5, a Roman 5, my lord, my lord, this submission here is. Atus. No, no, Roman 5 at page 15. The correct constitutional conduct 
for legislators who claim that they represent the original political party is to first get their claim resolved before indulging into prohibited conduct under the 10th schedule. Now, my lords, the core question, my lord, which arises for consideration of your lordships in this case, is that when there is an intra-party dispute, can, my lord, certain MLAs take the defense that, look here, I am the political party, and I will indulge into prohibited conduct under the 10th schedule. And after indulging into prohibited conduct, toppling government, forming the government, file proceedings on 19th of July before the election commission for not validating that claim. And the defense taken is, look here, I am the political party. So your lordships, my lord, are called upon to decide what is the correct course of conduct in this situation. Para 36, my lord, it is respectfully submitted that in the event of a dispute within the political party, the correct constitutional conduct for legislators who claim that they represent the original political party is to first get their claim resolved before indulging into prohibited conduct under the 10th schedule. It is submitted that if a legislature or a group of legislators have a claim that they represent the original political party, then it is imperative that such a claim has to be resolved or adjudicated upon and decided in accordance with law. Brahman and Reddy Malots was already cited. It is no defense in a disqualification petition to say that the defectors have a claim of constituting the original political party till such claims of MLAs that they represent the original political party attain fruition by a process known to law. Such MLAs are governed by the code of conduct prescribed by the 10th schedule. Any other interpretation would make the working of the 10th schedule untenable.